Hello students, very good evening to you all. How are you today? So I hope you are enjoying these live sessions. We have been doing this. Manipal Medes is committed to help you in um, passing these exams, getting a good rank, getting a good, uh, like your whatever subject you want, your, uh, your uh, PG uh, subject, whatever you want. So we are trying to do these live sessions and bring something new and innovative for you all. So for the last 15 days, all the tutors at Manipal Medes have been going live one by one and another five, six sessions are left. So today is the day for OBGY. Now, OBGY, I am Dr. Sonal Parihar, your OBGY consultant, your tutor at Manipal Medes. Hi, Dr. Nareen. So, um, why we are doing this? Because, see, you all are studying, right? You are preparing for NEET, PG, you are preparing for INSET. But our motive is to bring something innovative, something different for you because every tutor has a different way of teaching. You might gain from something that we tell you and you also need some brushing, some, some push from the teachers who have been practicing for so long, teaching for so long. So, yes, it will help you in, um, def in defining and making a strategy for yourself. Now, this is just one month left. Okay, so I, I want you all of you to realize that you have to start studying very seriously now. It should raise some goosebumps in you. If it doesn't raise any goosebumps, that means you're not prepared. That means you're not serious. So, if you're serious, this all these live sessions are going to raise some goosebumps and tell you exactly where you are failing and where you are lacking. Okay, so today, because it's a big subject, let's not waste time. I have already asked some of you who are connected with me as to what topics you want me to cover because OBGY is vast. It's very, very vast. Okay, at Manipal Medes, we already have those, uh, uh, like uh, the app is there. You can purchase the entire thing. You can purchase the summary things. And if you want to just go for the live sessions, the PDFs, then it is there in the free trial. So you can just subscribe to that and you can go for the free trials. You can get these PDFs, whatever we are teaching. But what I want to tell you is um, whenever we do the summary, any subject, whether it's a minor subject or a major subject, it will take around 10 to 15 hours, sometimes even 20 hours. On YouTube, we don't go more than two hours, maximum three hours. That is the maximum capacity a student can stay with us. So let's not waste time. I have selected some topics according to the PYQs and according to what you have um, asked me to discuss because certain topics are difficult for you. You don't know how to approach the questions. So let's start now. Hello, Dr. Abhishek. So there you go. So I'm Dr. Sonal Parihar. The topics that I have selected for today, I hope I'm able to finish it by the end of this session. Magnesium sulfate and PIH, that's a very high yield topic. I can see so many questions on magnesium sulfate. Genital cancers you have requested. Out of these, the most important is the cervical cancer. The most important is cervical cancer and CIN. You may get a question on postmenopausal bleeding when it kind of um, takes into account the endometrial cancer. Ovarian cancer, you may get something like pathology, the typical uh, appearances of ovarian cancer. Staging, you might get. Staging laparotomy, you might get. But the most important is cervical cancer and CIN. Hello, Dr. Ranjana. Um, hello, KK. Then the next topic that I have selected is GTN. That is again a part of genital cancers. DSDs, you have requested. It is a disorders of sexual development. Aminoria, primary and secondary. We will touch normal and abnormal puberty. I will not go through the embryology because that must have been covered by anatomy um, in your anatomy lectures. GDM, very important high yield. Among the medical complications in, in pregnancy, diabetes and anemia is something you should know. It should be on your fingertips. Very, very important. Because India is an anemic state and India is a diabetic state. So these two diseases are very important. Bishop score, I have just kept one question so that I can see how much you have revised your bishop and modified bishop score. Robson's classification is again just something you have to mug up, but I will tell you how to remember if it is difficult for you because I have been practicing for 25 years, so it is easy for me to remember. It is just kind of what all criteria they are putting in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, how they make it 10. Okay, so that becomes easy. And then the last will be partogram because one of you has requested, ma'am, we can't understand partogram, we cannot understand how to approach the question. So the last will be Partogram, okay, so quickly go through the we'll go through the PYQs the answers and the text related to that now answer this question for me a, 30, a 33 weeks multigravita woman presents with epigastric pain headache visual symptoms and proteinuria 3 plus so th that rings a bell it is a severe PET right severe PET but she's a preterm she's 33 weeks and she's a multi so these are the three pointers which are important 33 weeks multigravita and severe PET what is the next step of management tell me I give you 20 seconds. There is a little lag. So I know whenever you will answer, I will take some time to realize that you've answered. So I give you 20 seconds and then I'll start with the answer. So will you do an emergency cesarean section in this patient? 
you will give her dexamethasone for fetal lung maturity because she's preterm you will induce for vaginal delivery they haven't told you what is the vaginal condition whether the bishop score is good or not and whether will you will give a magnesium sulfate iv initially hello himanshi hello sanjay okay 25 seconds have gone so let me tell you the answer the answer is magnesium sulfate it is magnesium sulfate yes kk that's right it's magnesium sulfate why because the first thing is the patient is having imminent symptoms of eclampsia you don't want her to convulse because then then that will increase the maternal and the fetal mortality right mortality and morbidity so first you have to control the the symptoms of eclampsia so you give her magnesium sulfate once she is stabilized you give her uh, antihypertensives to control her blood pressure then you give her corticosteroids if the time allows you can give her corticosteroids after 24 hours the second dose or you can give her after 12 hours the second dose can be given sometimes even when you have to hasten the delivery you have to deliver her on the same day you can just give her one single dose that is also very effective according to acog one single dose can be given so the first thing is magnesium sulfate second will be antihypertensive therapy side by side you will give her steroid dose then you will assess her if the drugs are working well then you may um, postpone the pregnancy for another two three weeks you you may take her to term if possible delivery may be delayed for a few days depending upon the response of these drugs Next question, which of the following is not true regarding magnesium sulfate? What is wrong here? Magnesium sulfate will cause uterine relaxation, but it is dose dependent. Magnesium sulfate is continued 24 hours up to delivery or last attack of seizure, whichever comes late. It has an inhibitory effect on cerebral cortex, thereby preventing seizure and lowering the blood pressure. In renal failure, the magnesium sulfate loading dose can be given, but the maintenance dose should be adjusted based upon the renal function. Okay, I am setting the time again. 20 seconds for you to go. What is wrong here? Everything looks ab absolutely normal and right, absolutely true. But there is something which is wrong. Okay, your time is up. 20 seconds have gone. No answer yet? Okay. So the answer is C. What is C? Inhibitory effect on the cerebral cortex is right, but it is not going to cause lowering of blood pressure. This is wrong. It is not an antihypertensive. Remember, children, it is very, very important. Magnesium sulfate is not an epileptic drug. It is not an anti-epileptic. It is just going to cause vasodilatation. It is going to reduce the transmission of acetylcholine that reduces the current flowing in the brain. So that is an inhibitory effect on the cerebral cortex that reduces convulsions and seizures. Okay, but it is not used as an antihypertensive. It is not used as an anti-epileptic drug. It controls fits effectively without any depression. If it is within the therapeutic range, it will not cause any depression to the mother or the fetus. It is not given to treat hypertension. It reduces the risk of recurrent convulsions. Very, very important for you to remember. It is a drug of choice for prevention and treatment of convulsions only. Magnesium sulfate is indicated only in convulsions. Okay. Significantly reduces the maternal death rate by 3% and reduces the perinatal mortality rate also. Yes, it is neuroprotective, you are right, but it is not causing any decrease in the blood pressure. Then, what is the mechanism of action? Just quickly uh, recapitulating what you have read. It will block the NMDA receptors in brain, right? It has an inhibitory effect on cerebral cortex. It decreases the release of acetylcholine. The neurotransmitters decrease. So, the current flowing in the brain will decrease. That is why the brain becomes silent and the seizures reduce. It will cause cerebral vasodilatation. So, it will prevent cerebral hemorrhage, the most important cause of death and eclampsia. It will block the calcium channel blockers. Remember this. There was a question. There were a uh, uh, number of antihypertensives written as to all like labitalon, nifedipine and all. So one of them you have to choose which has to be used with caution along with magnesium sulfate. And what is that? That is calcium channel blocker. Calcium channel blockers will have a synergistic action with magnesium sulfate because both of them will act on calcium channels and they will block the channels. So calcium deficiency can happen. So it will stabilize the cell membrane by blocking these channels and decreases the intracranial edema. Now, it is excreted totally by the rene, uh, kidney. So that is the reason why this option is absolutely correct. It is not false. In renal failure, it is not because of magnesium toxicity that renal failure is happening. In renal failure, the magnesium excretion will be 
hampered because the renal system, the kidneys are not able to excrete it and that will lead to in turn magnesium toxicity. So you will give a loading dose but you will not give maintenance dose unless you make sure that there is no toxicity. Okay, so it is excreted by renal system. Short term tocolytic as, I, as you said uh, KK that it is ha it has a neuroprotective action but the problem is that when you are giving it at less than 32 weeks patient who is in preterm labor at less than 32 weeks for the cerebral protection of the baby at that time you have to be very sure that the magnesium toxicity is not happening because the therapeutic dose is between the uh, between 4 to 7 milli equivalents but here it has to be 8 to 10 milli equivalents to act. So, you are actually crossing that safety value, the safe uh, therapeutic range of magnesium sulfate to give it the benefit of preterm labor. So, it is not used as a tocolytic. Okay. So, that you have to remember. Now, the therapeutic range, they might ask you, it's a very important question. Different values, different units will be different. So, the most important that they will ask you or the most important one which is there in your books is 4 to 7 milli equivalents per liter. Hello, Dr. Vinay. 4 to 7 milli equivalents. But if they change the, the unit. Remember, it's I and I said they can do anything. Okay. So, if it's millimoles or if it's milligram per deciliter, the value will change. So, it is not 4 to 7. It will be 2 to 3.5 millimoles per liter. This is also per liter. But when it comes to milligram per deciliter, it becomes 4.8 to 8.4. So, just mug it up. You have to learn this. All three units are very, very important. Hello, Dr. Minakshi. So, till 24 hours after delivery or the last seizure, whichever appears late. So, if she has delivered and she did not have any seizure after that. So, after she delivers from there till 24 hours, you, you continue magnesium sulfate, then stop it. But in case she has a conversion after delivery, then you have to calculate those 24 hours from the time she had a conversion. Okay. Caution is it will, it will block the peripheral calcium channel. So, use it with caution in women who are already on calcium channel blockers. Absolute contraindication will be magne uh, of magnesium sulfate will be myasthenia gravis because you don't want to uh, reduce the acetylcholine transmission. Already they are under respiratory depression. So you don't want that. And deranged renal function because that will lead to accumulation of magnesium in the blood. Hello, Samta. Now, magnesium sulfate can cross placenta and it can lead to some effects on the fetal heart also. That is the reason most of the clinicians uh, will, like for example, when I was working in BHU, I was doing my PG. We at 3 a.m. always we were like the first years were ready with their magnesium sulfate kit because uh, in BHU we got the peripheral villages and the Bihar Bihar uh, trains coming from Bihar and the peripheral areas West Bengal. So at 3 a.m. 2:30 a.m. there would be one eclampsia every day, every day, every night we will get one eclampsia and one rupture uterus. That, that those were the days 97, 90, 97, 98, 99. These three years when I was my PG student, we used to wait for these patients. So. There will be some effects on the fetal heart. So, the first thing is the magnesium sulfate kit is ready. You have to stabilize the patient. You have to check the baby is live or not. And you have to quickly transfer the patient for delivery. Either in the labor room or cesarean. So, what I want to tell you is magnesium sulfate can have deleterious effect on the baby's heart also. Okay. So, it can cause what? It can cause decreased beat to beat variability. And it can also lead to bradycardia and prolonged deceleration, something like this. These are prolonged decelerations because of hypoxia. The patient herself is hypoxic. Oxygen saturation is less. So, the baby will also get less oxygen. Okay. So, a woman with eclampsia, answer this for me. Again, I'll put a timer. Woman with eclampsia is started on magnesium sulfate. What is the first sign of magnesium sulfate toxicity? Come on, it's very easy. Hypotension, low blood pressure, loss of knee jerk, reduced muscle tone or respiratory depression. Very simple. Answer this for me. You get only 15 seconds this time. It was the simplest question I can put for magnesium sulfate. Good KK. It is loss of knee jerk. So the deep tendon reflexes are the first ones to go and you have to keep checking to check for the magnesium toxicity. So assess the deep tendon reflexes periodically. Disappearance of the patellar reflex is the first sign of impending toxicity. Apart from that, what else can happen? Apart from that, diaphoresis, excess of sweating, slurring of speech, confusion and flushing can happen when the patient is getting magnesium toxicity. So the first thing to disappear will be patellar reflex and this happens at around 10 milli equivalents per liter. So the therapeutic range is 4 to 7. Once it reaches 10, the deep tendon reflexes will be gone. There is a narrow range at which therapeutic effect and th toxic effects of magnesium occurs. Therefore, monitoring of mag magnesium toxicity is very, very essential. Thank you, Sanjay. It is 2 years. So patellar reflex lost at 10 milli equivalents. Once it reaches 12 or more, it can cause respiratory depression. Paralysis, respiratory arrest can happen after 15. After 25, it will be cardiac arrest. Okay. So, these two things have to be prevented. These two, we can still manage. 
we can still manage by giving an antidote calcium gluconate calcium chloride can be given 10 ml of injection of 10 percent calcium gluconate 1 gram iv or calcium chloride can be given as an antidote okay this is all about magnesium sulfate another thing you need to know about magnesium sulfate is if there is oliguria i told you if there is renal uh, compromise then you have to measure serum creatinine if serum creatinine is getting high if it is more than one milligram per deciliter that means the creatinine is accumulating in the body and the renal system is failing in that case you have to measure serum serum magnesium levels serially to decide the infusion rate if at all the magnesium level is rising above seven milliequivalents per liter that means you know that the magnesium is accumulating and the infusion rate has to be decreased okay oliguria is not a sign of magnesium toxicity i just told you it is because of poor excretion from the kidneys that the magnesium will accumulate best marker of magnesium toxicity now you know that respiratory first of all it is dtr the deep tendon reflex then respiratory depression then respiratory paralysis then cardiac paralysis cardiac arrest now you don't want to go to respiratory arrest and cardiac arrest so what will you do you will just put a pulse oximeter you cannot uh, send the magnesium uh, uh, blood levels again and again to the lab and ask the lab to tell you the the uh, value of the magnesium in the blood so what you can do is simply put a pulse oximeter on the finger and there is a reduced oxygen saturation without oxygen the patient is not on oxygen on air if she is le having less than 90 percent saturation that means she is going towards respiratory depression and magnesium toxicity is happening so if they ask you what is the best marker of magnesium toxicity it is pulse oximetry okay now the loading dose again a very uh, favorite question of the examiners loading dose of max salt in preeclampsia now, when you become a resident in OBGY, you will come to know this because every day you will get an eclampsia. Maybe not that frequently as I used to get when I was doing my PG. But yes, you will have that magnesium sulfate. The yellow ampules will be there. So, is it 4 ml in 16 ml? So, 4 plus 16 is 20. This is also 8 plus 12 is 20. Okay. Then 12 plus 8 is also 20. So, they have purposely given this. Tell me the answer. 4 ml in 16 ml NS, 8 ml in uh, 12 ml NS, 12 ml in 8 ml NS or 10 ml magnesium sulfate everywhere it is 50 percent because we know that the ampule is 50 percent so they have not changed this 50 percent magnesium sulfate is there in the ampule okay kk you are saying c are you sure you want to check this again okay so i've already given you 25 26 seconds it's actually this remember one ampule of magnesium sulfate is 2 ml okay and this contains one gram magnesium sulfate so if you remember 14 grams is the total dose that we give four grams we give loading dose iv and the rest 10 grams we give im as maintenance dose and this 10 grams is divided into five and five in each buttock right buttock and left buttock okay yes abdul you're right it is b now why 8 ml they're giving now sorry i just rubbed it okay now 4 ml this one sounded better Initially, when you actually just look at the options, 4 ml will sound better because you are confused between 4 gram and 4 ml. Don't get confused. This is not gram. It is ml. So, when it comes to ml, it is actually 8 ml because when you are having 2 ml, 1 gram and if you want 4 grams means it will become 8 ml. So, you take 4 ampules and dilute it in 12 ml NS because you have to make it 20%. So, imagine 8 ml plus 12 ml will be 20 ml of the entire solution containing 4 grams of magnesium sulfate so with your maths you know it is 20 percent solution out of 20 only 4 gram is magnesium sulfate so from 50 percent solution initially it was 50 percent 2 ml containing 1 gram now you have made it 20 percent solution okay so the answer is 8 ml or if they tell you 4 gram if it is in gram then it is 4 gram magnesium sulfate in 12 ml ns because 4 gram will be 8 ml okay i hope i'm clear so the answer is B. 2 ml ampule has 1 gram magnesium sulfate. I just told you that is 50% solution. Pritchard regimen is loading dose 4 gram of 20% magnesium sulfate slow IV infusion. You make it 20% by adding 12 ml NS. So 8 plus 12 is 20. Okay. Load 4 ampules in 20 ml, add 12 ml. How, or how fast you have to give it? You have to be slow. So minimum is 4 minutes and maximum you can go like 1 ml per minute. So you can take up to 20 minutes but it, you don't have that much time patient is convulsing you need to give the iv dose so don't make it faster than 10 to 15 minutes okay so sorry minimum is four minutes and uh, maximum you can go up to 20 minutes so on an average 10 to 15 minutes you keep on injecting and your assistants will keep on uh, doing the other things that like take her bloods send it to the lab and the entire team will be working together somebody will be putting a catheter somebody would be putting a mouth gag so she doesn't uh, bite her tongue and the frothy secretions have to be sucked out so that she doesn't aspirate all these things will happen side by side.
okay total dose is 14 grams loading dose is given irrespective of the renal function very important don't get confused if they tell you the patient is under renal failure she, her uh, renal function is impaired so will you give loading dose or not loading dose has to be given if she is convulsing okay hi dr devik maintenance dose is followed by that is after 4 gram iv you have to give her 10 grams of 50 percent magnesium sulfate that means direct ampule you are taking you are taking the direct ampule without any dilution 5 gram means uh, 5 ampules on this buttock and 5 ampules on the other buttock direct IM okay it is given every 4 hours depending upon the magnesium levels in the body and the toxicity has to be monitored dose is 5 grams of 50 percent magnesium sulfate IM in alternate buttocks upper outer quadrant the needle has to be 3 inches long because you want to go deep inside the buttock you don't want it to just lie in the subcutaneous tissue it has to be deep and it has to begin till 24 hours after delivery or till the 24 hours have happened after the last season. Hello, Dr. Vidya. Okay. Answer this question for me. Pregnant woman at 30 weeks is having painful bleeding PB and her and a history of decreased fetal movements with a high blood pressure. So what does it what does that tell you? It's a PIH patient and she's having APH also, and there is some problem with the baby also, and she's only 30 weeks very preterm okay per abdomen 34 weeks so the gestational age was 30 but now she's 34 weeks so i'm just tell, helping you how to answer the question so the the fundal height is more than the gestational age contractions are present uterine tone is increased what does that tell you and the fetal heart is absent simple what is it anybody can you tell me what is your diagnosis pv she is well in labor active labor 6 centimeters 70 percent effaced vertex is at minus 2 bag of membrane is forming bom is bag of membrane don't get confused these are the short forms used by obstetricians in the labor room and that is how they ask you the question what should be the next step in management first of all you should know what is the patient what patient is it what is the diagnosis it is pih with what tell me and then tell me the answer okay okay, okay. so i got your answer can you tell me the diagnosis also Abruptio, very good. So it's PIH plus abruptio. The baby is dead. So in a dead baby, why will you do a cesarean section? Why will you give her tocolysis? Why will you make the patient suffer? The baby is already dead. Why do you want the contractions to stop and you want the patient to carry on the pregnancy? And why will you do a cesarean? Okay, so antihypertensives and ARM. ARM is going to hasten the delivery. You know ARM is going to release prostaglandins and it is a type of uh, induction of labor. So you are trying to hasten the delivery. She is already 6 centimeters. So she will deliver very fast. Yes, Sanjay, it is B. Next question. All of the following are theories of causation of preeclampsia except. Now, this is a very theoretical question. Dr. Ranjana might have, might have covered it. It's total pathology. But you need to know this because this has been asked. Now, Prostaglandins play an important role in uh, preeclampsia. Thromboxane A2 is decreasing. Prostacycline thromboxane ratio is increasing. So what they are asking in the first question is, since the denominator is decreasing, so the ratio is increasing. Is it true or false? They want you to tell the, the right answer. Endothelial dysfunction. Oh, sorry, except they want you to, sorry. They want you to tell the false answer, the wrong answer. Okay, so don't miss this word. I missed it, except. You have to tell what is wrong. Okay, everything is true, except. Endothelial cell dysfunction leads to reduced nitric oxide levels and this causes the clinical presentation of preeclampsia. Vasoconstriction leads to ischemia, necrosis, hemorrhage and organ damage seen in preeclampsia. Anti-angiogenic factors play an important role in preeclampsia. There is an increase in SFLT1 and decrease in PIGF that is placental growth factor. It is PLGF, PLGF. Tell me. It took me a long time to uh, read the question. You must have now reached the conclusion as to what is the answer. What does thromboxane A2 do? TXA2 is a vasoconstrictor or a vasodilator? It is a vasoconstrictor. Prostacycline, PGI2, that is the short form we use for prostacycline. It is a vasodilator. Now tell me, in preeclampsia, what is going to increase? Right, KK. It is A. Thromboxane A2 has to increase, placental growth factor is decreasing, SFLT1 is increasing, all the bad factors are increasing. Thromboxane A2 is increasing, SFLT1 is increasing, endothelial cell dysfunction is the major dictum which is basically destroying all the organs, kidney, liver, uh, eyes, all the end organ damage is because of the endothelial cell dysfunction. So all are true, ischemia, necrosis, the only thing is this is the reverse, this is the answer, the reverse is true. It is actually decreasing. The ratio is decreasing because thromboxane A to the denominator is increasing. Prostacycline is decreasing. Okay. 
So thromboxane A2 increases, prostacyclin decreases, ratio decreases, etopathogenesis includes all the vasoconstrictors are increasing, SFLT1 is soluble, FMS like tyrosine kinase, just mug it up, you should know what it is. Thromboxane A2 and serum and are increasing, dilators are decreasing, placental growth factor, VEGF are decreasing, inflammation is happening all over the body, so cytokines, tumor necrosis factor, oxidative stress is increasing, interleukins are increasing. Immunological intolerance, there is an intolerance between the maternal and the fetal tissues. That is why female who gets married to a second partner and she conceives again, even though it's not her first pregnancy, but she's exposed to the, the, uh, the sperms of the partner, the second partner, the new partner. At that time, she can have preeclampsia again. It will be like a foreign body triggering the immune system and increase oxygen free radicals because of the oxidative stress. Okay, next question. Woman with 35 plus 5, so she is almost term, 36 weeks gestation, complaints of epigastric pain, headache, blurring of vision. So again, this is a severe PET, blurring of vision is there. BP is quite high, 170, 110. She is having labor pains. Examination, she is almost in active labor, 3 centimeter dilated. Bag of liquor means bag of membrane is forming. What is the management here? Tell me. Let me put the timer on. Okay. Conservative management. Administering tocolytics and delivering at three, three, 37 weeks. Treat hypertension, magnesium sulfate, cancer termination. Okay. KK, you are answering A, C, Sohail, you are C. Give steroid cover and wait until steroid cover is complete. Okay, KK, you said C. A, you said for the previous question. So, you both are correct. It is C. 36 weeks gestation, you don't need a steroid cover. She is fine. The baby is fine. You have to treat hypertension, yes. Administer magnesium sulfate and consider termination because in termination, after termination only, you can basically help the patient come out of this problem. It's a defective placenta. So, you have to terminate the pregnancy. So, this is the answer, the proper answer. Tocolytics is of no use at 36 weeks. Even if she is not having any uh, preeclampsia or eclampsia, she is having preterm labor at 36 weeks. Go and deliver her. She is 3 centimeter dilated. Bag is forming. What will you have? Uh, what uh, uh, advantage will you have by reducing the contractions and delaying the pregnancy for another one week? Technically, 37 weeks is term. But if she is an established preterm labor at 36 weeks, you don't need to do anything. So, conservative management never. When she is a pre severe preeclamptic, hypertension, magnesium sulfate, stabilize the patient and then terminate the pregnancy. So, there is no role of all this. We have already discussed. Okay. Now, most commonly, now we have done with the we are done with the PIH and magnesium sulfate. Now coming to most commonly seen in a 26-year-old female with intrauterine adhesions. What is that? Why have I kept this question? Because I got a lot of queries on this question, and the question can be changed in two forms. It can be either they can give you simply symptoms, dysmenorrhea, uh, uh, recurrent pregnancy loss, hypomenorrhea, oligomenorrhea, secondary amenorrhea. They may give you these options infertility so what will be your answer here what is the answer of this question and what is the answer of this question give me uh, like uh, a b c d and e and f okay answer the first question first most commonly seen in a 26 year old female with asherman syndrome sanjay abdul c c b tarun b okay what will be the answer for this what is the most common menstrual irregularity in asherman syndrome hypomenorrhea oligomenorrhea dysmenorrhea rpl Secondary amenorrhea, RPL is not menstrual irregularity. Okay, Stardust is saying C and A. You can answer just one, no? How can you say C and A? Okay, so you want to say that the most um, uh, common menstrual irregularity in Ashiman is A, hypomenorrhea. Anybody else? Okay. So, the answer here is infertility. You are right. Somebody said C. Abdul, you said C. Sanjay, you said C. Here, it will be secondary amenorrhea. Now, what is the difference between both the questions? One question is giving you only the symptoms. The second question is asking you out of menstrual irregularity, which is the most common. Right? So, if they give you, like for example, in this question, if they had asked you, the most common uh, uh, complaint in a patient will be either infertility or RPL, recurrent pregnancy loss, or menstrual irregularity, in that case, you will say menstrual irregularity. So, if it's a common group, they're asking you, a common group of complaints, it is menstrual irregularity. But if they ask you specific symptoms, then it is infertility. Am I clear? If not, then tell me. If they ask you one particular subset, infertility, RPL, menstrual irregularity, it is menstrual irregularity for sure. 
out of menstrual irregularity it is secondary amenorrhea followed by hypomenorrhea scanty menses then oligomenorrhea means delayed menses but when it comes to typical symptoms then it is infertility okay so that is the reason why i took this scanty question menses, here. Then sorry then Asherman syndrome, highest risk is excessive curettage. Most common cause is DNC in the postpartum period. You know that. Followed by DNC for missed abortion. So, whenever you do a DNC in a patient who is either postpartum after delivery or after abortion or you have done a packing, you try and packing, she, she just delivered and all the sinuses are open, the raw area is there and you have done, done a packing at that. At that time, you may cause Asherman syndrome. What are you writing, KK? Hypomenorrhea plus infertility both. Yes. Hypomenorrhea is there, but when it comes to, it depends upon how they are framing the question. So, the question that I told you here, infertility is the main complaint that commonly seen thing. But in the menstrual irregularity, you will select secondary amenorrhea if it is there. If it is not there, then you select hypomenorrhea, means scanty menses. The latest AUB definitions from oligomenorrhea, hypomenorrhea, it has changed. Okay, so it will be scanty menses. Then the other causes of Asherman syndrome will be endometritis due to tuberculosis and schistosomiasis, TCRE. That is trans cervical resection of endometrium, which is not done anymore. And any uterine surgery, which can lead to adhesions. You have opened the uterine cavity, done a surgery on the endometrium, on the myometrium, myomectomy, metroplasty, cesarean. In that case, you may cause Asherman syndrome. Okay. Then, complain of menstrual irregularity. As I told you, the most common, as a group, it is the most common symptom. Are followed by infertility, followed by re re uh, recurrent pregnancy loss. So, when it is a group, then the first will be menstrual irregularity, second will be infertility, and third will be recurrent pregnancy loss. Among menstrual irregularity, it is secondary amenorrhea, followed by scanty menses, followed by delayed menses. Okay? If the choice is secondary amenorrhea, hypomenorrhea, oligomenorrhea, and infertility, the answer is infertility. We are done with it. That is all I want you to know about Asherman syndrome. Okay. Coming to this question now. Now we are coming to endometrial hyperplasia and endometrial cancer, starting with genital cancers. 50-year-old lady came with abnormal bleeding per vaginum and an enlarged uterus. So she is 50, menopausal, perimenopausal, abnormal bleeding, postmenopausal bleeding, enlarged big uterus. Big uterus means you are kind of ruling out cervical cancer. You are kind of going towards endometrial hyperplasia or maybe a fibroid or maybe an endometrial cancer. Okay, so you have some uterine pathology. Which of the following is the most suitable diagnosis? Remember, most suitable diagnosis, first line diagnosis, different things they will ask. First line diagnostic tool, then uh, most suitable diagnostic test or you can say the next step of management. All these things are very, very confusing. So, what will be your answer? Natasha is saying B, Abdul is saying D, KK is saying C. Okay. So, let me answer this. This CT and MRI are very, very costly procedures, right? So, when will you do CT and MRI? MRI is generally done for soft tissue delineation. You have to remember these students. MRI is basically to delineate between uterine sarcoma, uterine fibroid, adenomyosis. So, whenever there is a soft tissue problem which sonography cannot pick up, you do MRI. It's costly. CT scan is also costly. CT scan is done when you want to establish that yes, you, you know it is a cancerous case. You want to see how much it has, um, uh, like uh, how much it has spread, whether the lymph nodes are involved or not. So, CT and MRI are basically done when there is a difference in the, uh, the diagnosis, the biopsy and the sonography. You are not able to reach the conclusion or you have to stage the cancer. Initially, we used to do the staging laparotomy. Now, CT scans, PET scans, MRIs are helping us. So, this will not be the most suitable diagnostic criteria. Okay. So, the answer here will be, it is not TBS Tarun. If you say TVS, it will be the next step of management, yes. The next step of management will be TVS. But the most suitable diagnostic test will be hysteroscopy. Because in hysteroscopy, we can do a biopsy. We can visualize whether it's a focal growth, whether there is some other pathology. There is a polyp hanging. There is a fibroid hanging which was not diagnosed in ultrasound. But yes, the first line diag investigation or the next step of management will be TVS. But the most suitable diagnostic thing, that is what they are asking, the most appropriate diagnostic investigation will be hysteroscopy because it has so many advantages. It can be diagnostic, it can be therapeutic, you can do a biopsy, you can do a fractional cuterage, you can do everything. Okay. So, postmenopausal bleeding, abnormal bleeding means she is postmenopausal or perimenopausal, enlarged uterus. So, this is how you approach the question. So, we have done this all. Uh, we don't need to repeat this, solving each response to get the best result. Now, 
staging of endometrial cancer quickly recapitulating this this might come as a question a proper uh, direct question they might give you that this is the spread of the cancer and what is the stage okay stage 1 will be confined to the uterine corpus so this is the uterus and if the cancer if this is the myometrium here this is the myometrium so they will tell you where the cancer is okay so the cancer if it is lying in half of the myometrium only this much only this much of the cancer is occupying the myometrium then that means stage 1a 1b will be occupying more than 50% of the myometrium so that will be stage 1b 2 is invading the cervical stroma that means it has become a cervical cancer now stage 3 is regional or local spread right and stage 3a will be uterine serosa and stage 3b will be just near the uterus in the parametrium or in the vagina now how do you manage why am i putting management in between i'm not completing the staging because i want you to understand the stage and the step stage wise management because once we go towards the fourth stage and we come back to stage one in the management you will forget it's very confusing okay so the management options in endometrial cancer remember there is a contraceptive uh 50 percent reduction with the ocps anything anything which reduces the thickness of the endometrium will reduce the chances of endometrial cancer like for example smoking smoking is also reducing the thickness of the endometrium because it decreases estrogen level it decreases estradiol so smoking is a protective factor for endometrial cancer but it is not a protective factor it is a high risk factor for cervical cancer okay so contraception and mirena coil are protective for endometrial cancer because it is reducing the thickness of the endometrium anything which is reducing the end the estrogen level now the modalities treatment modalities which we normally discuss are surgery and radiotherapy chemotherapy also because if it is a very old patient with comorbidities you will avoid surgery and radiotherapy you may give her chemotherapy and the chemotherapy is the same what we use in ovarian cancer cisplatin carboplatin paclitaxel taxol adriamycin so you don't need to mug up because it's all very simple it just keeps on repeating okay so these are the three modalities combined therapy yes ccrt can be given that is combined chemotherapy and radiotherapy ccrt okay hormonal therapy i will put a big question mark because i haven't seen any questions on that no direct questions on hormonal therapy because it is something which um, uh, the the oncologist will know it is above your level so you don't need to know whether the progesterone receptors are present or not the pathologist will tell you uh, in the biopsy that okay these immunofactors are there immunostaining is there so you can give tamoxifen you can give progesterone so this is not a question expected so you have to stick to surgery radiotherapy plus minus chemotherapy now stage 1 grade 1 and two grade one and two grade one and two means it is either a well differentiated or moderately differentiated we are not talking about the poorly differentiated grade three grade three is poorly differentiated so stage one a less than 50 percent of the myometrium but it is less than two centimeter then it is only simple hysterectomy when it is more than two centimeter we do a pelvic lymph node dissection so this two centimeter demarcation is not there in the staging but it is there in the management remember this stage one b more than 50 percent of the myometrium involved same because it is more than 50% now radiotherapy will step in so radiotherapy is stepping in as soon as stage 1b is happening is more than 50% of the myometrium involvement remember this radiotherapy no radiotherapy till stage 1a in endometrial cancer stage 1a after that 1b you start with radiotherapy but depending upon the size of the tumor if it is less than 2 no lymph node dissection more than 2 you do a pelvic lymph node dissection now you all know the uterus will drain into internal iliac lymph nodes then external iliac lymph nodes and then the common iliac and then the paraiotic so this is the sequence how it goes the internal iliac then the uh, external iliac then the common iliac and then the paraiotic so this is how the sequence goes okay so you should know as to what dissection has to be done in stage 2 when it has reached the cervix it will be verdibes either type 2 or type 3 you should know what is type 2 to what is type 3 i'm not going to the details if you want to uh, me to remember you you want me to uh, like explain this to you i will come to that slide if you want me to skip it i'll skip it now pelvic and paraiotic lymph node dissection is done in stage 2 why paraiotic because now it is spreading to the cervix and it is a advanced stage carcinoma so it is not just pelvic we are going to pelvic paraiotic also plus rth also radiotherapy also hello dr abirami okay coming to stage 3 now 3a and 3b we have done 3a is invading the uterine serosa till here and 3b is vagina and parametrium what is 3c 3c is metastasis to the lymph nodes so metastasis to the lymph nodes this is pelvic and this is paraiotic c2 c1 and c2 4 is very simple just like cervical cancer bladder bowel mucosa is 4a and 4b will be intra-abdominal liver and inguinal lymph nodes and all okay 
Now, how do we manage stage 3 and stage 4? Stage 3, whether it's grade 1 and 2, everywhere it is grade 1 and 2. So far, we are not talking about grade 3. Grade 3 will become, all grade 3 tumors will come in one nutshell. All grade 3 tumors will be poorly differentiated. So, they will all come in one nutshell where you will add chemotherapy, radiotherapy. Surgery will be stage-wise, depending upon whether it's stage 1A, it's stage 1B. So, TH, BSO in stage 1, stage 2 is Vardimes, stage 3 onwards it becomes radical. So, that will depend upon the stage. But if it is grade 3, you have to give radiotherapy, you have to do pelvic lymph node dissection, you have to do parioteal lymph node dissection and you have to give plus minus chemotherapy. Okay, stage 4 will be obviously debulking because now we cannot remove the entire tumor, it is spread everywhere. Okay, and stage 3 is Vardimes type 2 or type 3 plus all those paraiotic and lymph node dissection and radiotherapy. So, very simple, still stage 1, there is no radiotherapy. Stage B, uh, stage 1B onwards, we do radiotherapy. Stage 1A, no radiotherapy. Stage 1A, less than 2 centimeter, no pelvic uh, lymph node dissection. Stage 1B also, less than 2 centimeter, no lymph node dissection. Okay. Remember, this is a very important question, all type 2 tumors. You know endometrial cancer has been divided pathologically into adenosquamous, endometrioid, papillary, clear cell. But there is another definition or another division of endometrial cancer into type 1 and type 2. What are these? Type 1 are the ones with good prognosis. I'll come to that table. Type 2 are the ones which are happening in the postmenopausal age group, which are not estrogen dependent and they have a very high malignant potential. And they will include which ones? They will include clear cell carcinoma, papillary carcinoma, all the type 3 uh, grade, uh, uh, not the type 3, the grade 3 uh, carcinomas, they will all be included in the type 2. So, whenever the question says it's a clear cell carcinoma, papillary carcinoma or a very poorly differentiated carcinoma, it will fall into this category. So, again, you will do a stage-wise surgery depending upon stage 1A, 1B, stage 2, stage 3. But you will not miss lymph node dissection, both pelvic and paraiotic. You will not miss chemotherapy, radiotherapy plus you will not miss omentectomy and peritoneal washings. Peritoneal washings, biopsy, okay? Just like ovarian carcinoma because these papillary, clear cell, endometrial carcinomas, they will spread through the peritoneum. So, omentectomy and peritoneal washings have to be done in all type 2 tumors. Okay, now lymph node dissection as I told you is done only in all type 2 varieties when it is a high risk one or 1A grade 3 of type 1 variety means it's a grade 3, any type of grade 3 variety. Stage 1A only if it is tumor size is more than 2 centimeter, stage 1B when it is more than 2 centimeter. So, this we just did in this table. Don't get confused, I have just recapitulated it, just re rewritten it. So, basically lymph node dissection is done only when the tumor is more than 2 centimeter in cases of Stage 1. After that, lymph node dissection is done in all, in all grade 3 tumors and in all type 2 tumors we do a lymph node dissection. RTH is not required till stage 1A if it is grade 1 and 2. If it is grade 3, poorly differentiated, you have to give everything, do everything. Okay? Then coming to types of endometrial carcinoma depending upon how they behave. So, that is type 1 and type 2. Very important. Type 1 is having a good prognosis. So, the unopposed estrogen, the estrogen dependence will be there. It will be perimenopause, not postmenopause. It will be dependent on the estrogen. It will be well differentiated, minimal invasion. These are all endometrioid and adenocarcinomas grade 1 and 2. It will not be a poorly differentiated one. It will not be papillary clear cell. It will be simply endometrial adenocarcinoma. And the patient will be obese, generally seen in white, white races, polyploid because of excess of estrogen. There will be no expression of these bad genes, P53, HER2 and new overexpression. No. It will only be P10 mutation which will be seen which has a good prognosis. Okay, so the P10 mutation is good for endometrial cancer. Remember, P10 mutation is a gatekeeper gene. The gatekeeper gene for endometrial cancer is P10 because it has a good prognosis. It is just the opposite in type 2. So, this is not favorable. These are present, but this is absent. Aneuploid, black females, postmenopause, no estrogen dependence, poor uh, differentiation, deep invasion, papillary serous, clear cell, all grade 3 adenocarcinomas and these are thin patients. So, these will require excessive radiotherapy, chemotherapy, surgery, omentectomy, everything will be required in type 2 tumors. Okay. Hi, Rajni. Okay. 70 year old female, answer this for me. Now, you know the staging and now you know the, uh, the uh, how you manage it also. 70 year old woman presents with endometrial cancer that has spread to the lymph nodes. What is the most appropriate treatment? So, 70 year old woman with endometrial cancer has spread to the lymph nodes. Tell me the answer. 
surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, hormone therapy. It's a very incomplete question. The stem of the question is also incomplete. The options are also very incomplete because you will not just do one, you will combine them together. But what they want you to understand is it's an old lady with a extensive cancer which has spread to the lymph nodes. What will you do? Thank you, Abdul. It is C. It is chemotherapy. Surgery. The best answer would be what? The best answer would be surgery if she doesn't have any comorbidities like debulking surgery. It can be debulking, right? Plus chemotherapy plus minus radiotherapy. Now, because she's old, they want you to understand that radiation therapy is going to have a lot of side effects. Then surgery again may not be possible. It will be extensive surgery in cases where, where it has spread to the pelvic lymph nodes. So the first thing we do is a new adjuvant chemotherapy. New adjuvant chemotherapy. That means before surgery, we try to reduce the size or sometimes just chemotherapy palliative treatment. Yes, thank you, Abirami. It is C. Now, approach is age not very appropriate for surgery. Lymph node spread 3C stage. It is a 3C stage. Okay. Advanced stage, it will need exenterative surgery. Old age plus lymph node involvement, poor prognosis and most appropriate, the lead is asking you what is the most appropriate treatment. That is how we approach the question. So, again, the same thing. Radiotherapy, they are quite sensitive, but side effects are more. Chemotherapy is best option, and that is Taxol, Adriamycin, Paclitacil, that is TAP, right? Hormone therapy, there is no mention of whether the cancer is hormone dependent or not. We don't know. So, I told you, just don't mention hormone therapy in endometrial cancer. Stick to radiotherapy, surgery, and chemotherapy. Now, 55-year-old lady, postmenopausal woman, presents with abnormal uterine bleeding. Okay, endometrial biopsy is showing endometrial carcinoma with hop nail cells with grade 1 differentiation. MRI was suggestive of stage 1A. Now, you know it is an early carcinoma, stage 1A. It is grade 1, which is very good prognosis, but there is hob nail cell. What do you mean by hob nail cell? What does it indicate? What kind of cancer it is? You must have read in pathology. Tell me, what should be the appropriate kind of surgery here? What kind of tumor is it? Hob nail cell. Waiting for your answer. Somebody? Okay, waiting for your answer. No answers? Hobnail cells are seen in clear cell carcinoma. I just told you clear cell carcinoma is a type of type 2 tumor. So now type 2 tumor, you will do radiotherapy, you will do chemotherapy, you will do a pelvic and parioting lymph node dissection, yes. Plus you will do omentectomy and peritoneal washings, just like ovarian cancer. But because it is stage 1 with grade 1 differentiation, you will simply go for a TH and BSO. Okay, so you don't need to go for vardimes or exenterative surgery. So the answer will be, Natasha is saying uh, TH with BSO omentectomy peritoneal biopsy because this is what I just told you. But there is a difference between lymph node sampling and lymph node dissection. What will you choose? So definitely this is wrong. This is wrong. Now what is the right answer here? They are almost the same. One is saying sampling, one is saying dissection. What will you do here? Sohail, Sonali. Okay. Uh, Shimona. Hi Shimona. Hi Wondergap. Okay, no. A and B are wrong. It is actually a stage 1 carcinoma, stage 1A, that is less than 50% of the myometrium involved. So, I told you in stage 1A, we don't do lymph node dissection if it is less than 2 cm. But because it is type 2 tumor, we are doing that. But in this case, we will not do a dissection, we will do a sampling. So, this is the correct answer. C is the correct answer. Why to subject her for dissection? Don't remove the entire pelvic and parioteal lymph nodes. Do a sampling. Because it's a type 2 tumor, because you know the biopsy has come back as clear cell carcinoma, do sampling. While doing surgery, you will see some lymph nodes popping up. They might be enlarged. Do that sampling. If you can't see any popping up lymph nodes, enlarged lymph nodes, then you just go to the pelvic lymph nodes, the most commonly involved, the internal eyelid. If that comes back positive, then you can give her radiotherapy or chemotherapy. Okay? It's all right, all right Natasha. You can always answer the next question. Hobnail cells are found in clear cell carcinoma, which is rare, very aggressive. Grade 1 does not need extensive surgery. So, it is TH, BSO, stage 1A, early carcinoma, restricted to the uterus, less than 50% of the myometrium involved. This option is correct for normal endometrioid carcinoma. Now, this we have already discussed. Let us not solve each and every response. So, if, to, if it was an endometrioid carcinoma, adenocarcinoma, then the option would have been TH, BSO, right? Because it is grade 1, dif differentiation stage 1. 
stage 1a less than 50 percent of the myometum is involved so because they haven't mentioned whether it is less than 2 centimeter more than 2 centimeter if it was mentioned less than 2 more than 2 then you would have been confused whether we do lymph node or not so if it is less than 2 centimeter endometroid i'm talking about endometroid i'm just changing the question Remember, if it is endometrioid or adenocarcinoma, less than 2 cm, the option is this. If it is again endometrioid carcinoma, but more than 2 cm, you do a lymph node dissection. But because this is type 2 tumor, so you are going for omentectomy, peritoneal biopsy with lymph node sampling because it is early carcinoma. If it was advanced, stage 2, cervical, uh, can, uh, cervix has been involved, then it has been, it would have been lymph node dissection. I hope that is clear. Now. Coming to the next question, 50-year-old woman presents with postmenopausal bleeding, thickened endometrium on transvaginal ultrasound. Endometrial biopsy shows a poorly differentiated grade 3 tumor, grade 3 endometrial cancer and that is endometrioid, that is type 1. Type 1 is endometrioid or adenocarcinoma. CT shows no evidence of metastasis. So, it is an early cancer but it is poorly differentiated. So, the main dictum will lie on this. It is early carcinoma, it is type 1 because it is endometrioid, adenocarcinoma, but there is no, but it is a grade 3, okay. So, what is the appropriate management? What will you do now? Come on, tell me. Total abdominal hysterectomy, bilateral salping ophrectomy, that is TH, BSO, just to confuse you, TAH with BSO, with omentectomy, peritoneal biopsy, that is done in type 2, not type 1. TH, BSO with lymph node dissection, TH, BSO with lymph node dissection plus minus radiotherapy, lymph node dissection plus minus chemotherapy, what will you do? Had it been a grade 1 or grade 2, not a poorly differentiated grade 3, we would have selected, we would have selected, it is, there is no evidence of metastasis. In that case, we would have just done maybe TH, BSO with lymph node dissection or sampling or simply radiotherapy depending it is 1B or 1A. It is a, the stem of the question is not very clear. So, what will you do? No starters, it is not omentectomy and peritoneal biopsy. It is not a type 2 tumor, it is a type 1 tumor. In type 1 tumor, you go with the stage wise management. All grade 3 tumors, whether it's type 1 or type 2, you have to go with lymph node dissection, you have to do a radiotherapy. So, the answer is this one. It is not this, it is not this, it is not this. It is C. Yes, Abdul, it is C. Okay? Because it is adenocarcinoma. Adenocarcinoma falls in the type 1 category. The, the main point here is grade 3. This is going to change everything. So, type 2 tumor, you do omental biopsy, you do peritoneal washing, you do radiotherapy, lymph node dissection, everything. In grade 3, or mental biopsy, peritoneal washing not required, but radiotherapy, chemotherapy and um, lymph node dissection is very, very important. So, that is how you do this, okay. THBSO, why? Because it is not a metastatic cancer, so you are not doing vardimes or radical hysterectomy, right. I hope it is clear now, because now I am moving on to the next topic, molar pregnancy, GTN, choriocarcinoma, okay. Now, a 35-year-old woman with a complete molar pregnancy presents with HCG level of 2 lakhs. International units per ml, very high HCG level. What will be the next appropriate management? You will give her uh, chemotherapy, you will give her, uh, you will do a hysterectomy on a 35 year old patient, you will do a repeat curettage, or you will just simply observe. Tell me. Come on, I am waiting. What are the uh, options here? I mean, what is the best option here for you? A. Okay. C. No, I would go with A. What are the indications of um, chemotherapy? Very high HCG level or there is a TLC that is theca lutein cyst more than 6 cm and there are other option, uh, other, other indications also. So, methotrexate chemotherapy, she has also already has had a DNC. That is why we know it is a complete molar pregnancy, right? DNC has been done. She is not bleeding. They have not mentioned she is bleeding. So, we will not do a repeat curettage. No, we will go for methotrexate chemotherapy because you may do a repeat curettage. The best answer would be you do a HCG level which has already been done. You do a TVS also. You may do a repeat curettage if required. If you see that there is a lot of thickness inside and then you give a methotrexate. That has to be given. This has to be the option. Okay. Best option would have been a combination. Hysterectomy, no. Observation, not at all. 2 lakh HCG, no. So, you have to give a methotrexate chemotherapy. So, high levels of uh, HCG. Lead is most appropriate treatment after one suction evacuation. Patients with high risk gestation trophoplastic neoplasia, when the HCG is more than 1 lakh, they have to treat to be treated with chemotherapy. Now, whether it is a single agent or a multi agent, that will uh, depend upon whether it is a high risk or a low risk. But that is basically when, when we diagnose choriocarcinoma. In choriocarcinoma, we decide whether it's, it has to be emaco regimen, multi drug, or a single regimen depending upon the WHO scoring. If it is 6 or less than 6, it is single agent. If it is more than 7, then it is 
uh, the high risk one but we are talking here about the complete molar pregnancy it is not a uh, choriocarcinoma hysterectomy not recommended repeat curettage no use okay then remember the indications of hysterectomy and remember the indications of chemotherapy indications for hysterectomy here will be women more than 40 family is complete lesion is confined to the uterus okay so, women who are more than 40, they are having this problem, persistent uh, molar pregnancy or uh, there is excessively high uh, HCG level or she is bleeding and then we, we are repeating the curettage. Why? She has completed her family to a hysterectomy. PSTT, we know PSTT is what? Placental side trophoblastic tumor or ETT, epithelioid trophoblastic tumor, even invasive mole. In invasive mole also, the option is hysterectomy. Okay? Intractable vaginal bleeding. Localized uterine lesion when the stage 1 GTN is resistant to chemotherapy. So, either her family is complete or it is a typical this type of tumor or there is too much bleeding or when there is resistance to chemotherapy or you have perforated the uterus accidentally during curettage and there is an invasive mole. Okay. So, these are the indications for hysterectomy. Chemotherapy is indicated when the, uh, the initial level of HCG is either very high or it is plateauing. So, in this case, it was it was high, very high. Bilateral thecal uterine cyst is more than 6 cm. Age more than 35, you will go for chemotherapy. But that doesn't say that if she is 25 and she is having all the other risk factors, you will not give a chemotherapy. Then, evidence of metastasis irrespective of the level of HCG. Initial large size of the uterus. Women cannot come for follow-up. You know that this patient is not going to come for follow-up. Okay. Now, IUCD is the best contraceptive. Well, you... IUCD, yes, initially it, IUCD was said to not to be used, but I would say barrier contraceptives are the best, although they do have a uh, very high uh, failure rate. But yes, IUCD has been recommended now. In fact, after six months after the follow up, once the HCG is below five, she can even go for OCPs. IUCD is better to avoid initially when she is having irregular bleeding because that can lead to um, false diagnosis of continuous bleeding or irregular bleeding. Okay. Now, women cannot come for follow up. Initial large size of uterus, high HCG, uh, evidence of metastasis and high risk of choriocarcinoma. The risk factors are the very young or above 40 multipara who refuses hysterectomy. These are the indications for uh, chemotherapy in GTN. Now answer this question for me. 23 year old lady had complaints of persistent vaginal bleeding after a complete molar pregnancy. Now initially in the first question it was the HCG level was very high. Now she is having persistent bleeding. What will you do? You will do a hysterectomy? No way at 23 years. I am just... Um, crossing the options which are absolutely not required. Observation, no way she is bleeding. So, what is the, your answer? Chemotherapy or repeat curettage? Slightly different question and I am sure you will be able to answer this. 23 year old, very young lady, persistent bleeding even after one DNC because the diagnosis is complete molar pregnancy. What will you do? Will you give her chemotherapy? You may. They haven't told you the beta HCG level. But what will be the first option? The first option will be repeat curettage. Yes, Abdul, very, very right. It is uh, repeat curettage in this case, okay? So, the best option here will be do a beta HCG, do a TVS followed by repeat curettage if required and you may give her chemotherapy also. But she is very young. So, indication of chemotherapy is generally after 35 years, okay? Complete molar pregnancy has a risk of developing persistent GTN. That is the reason why we don't leave it. 15% risk of developing a persistent GTN. So, we have to treat it and we have to see that the HCG levels come back to less than 5. And the lead will be the next step of management. The lead question, the stem of the question that is very, very important. Now, this we have already discussed. Next question, 30-year-old woman with a partial molar pregnancy. Partial molar pregnancy means the baby is visible. Some parts of the baby are visible. Okay. It has been treated with suction and curettage. What is the appropriate follow-up protocol for this patient? So, the patient has had DNC. It came back as partial mole. Partial molar pregnancy will mimic like, it will look like a missed miscarriage because the baby will be seen and there will be some vesicular uh, growths there, placental growths will be there. So, the answer, what I am getting, Ashutosh is saying B, Stardust is saying B. Okay. Anybody else? Definitely, you will not do a single measurement. You will not leave it that you will not do SCG measurement. No, the answer is A. You have to do it every month. Why do you want to do it every week? It is not... A complete mole. It is a partial mole. It has a very low uh, malignant potential. It has a very low um, incidence of becoming persistent. So, you go for A. HCG measurement every month till the HCG comes back to normal. That is how they confuse you. Both the stems are so similar. 
so approach to this question is that the young patient is there so you will obviously uh, think about not chemotherapy although the option is not there partial mole has low malignant potential so explanation is after treatment of partial molar pregnancy the patient should have monthly hcg levels till it returns back to normal this is because there is a risk of developing persistent gtn and the hcg levels are a useful marker for monitoring to detect these problems let us quickly recapitulate what we have read before and you can just tick 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 with me go very fast that yes you know this karyotyping here it is triploidy partial mode is one sperm plus sperm plus egg and this egg is not inactive it is active remember so it is a triploidy okay so it can be 69 xxy one x is from the mother this x is from the mother other two sperms can be one x one y one both can be x or both can be y so these can be the three types of chromosomal structures in partial mole now triploidy and diploidy you know what it is diploidy means this is just one sperm plus one sperm plus empty egg this is inactive so yes egg has been fertilized but this is inactive so there, we are not considering this egg at all so it is one sperm plus one sperm which is monospermic and diaspermic what do you mean by that this is always diandry and diaspermic means there are two sperms in complete mole one sperm generally duplicates it becomes monospermic one sperm generally duplicates and gives rise to its brother okay so this becomes double because it is duplicating so it is generally monospermic but it can be diaspermic like partial mole so difference between diaspermy monospermy means how many sperms are fertilizing the egg difference between diandry and monoandry this is diandry okay and this is monospermic and diaspermic androgenesis means entire genetic material is paternal that is the difference androgenesis you need to know is seen only in complete mole it is not seen, seen in partial mole so diandry uh, monospermy diaspermy is just the same monospermy means one sperm diaspermy or diandry means two sperms in triploidy there are two sperms plus one egg so there is triploidy of the triple genetic material in complete mole it is just the sperm which is either duplicating or two sperms are fertilizing an empty egg okay Thank you, Akshat. Histopathology. Hydropic degeneration is less. Obviously, everything is less in partial mold. Some fetal parts are seen, so it looks like a missed abortion. Some blood vessels are also seen because the maternal genome is active. Trophoblastic scalloping is seen. Inclusion bodies are seen. Everything is present. In molar pregnancy, sorry, I'm just in the camera. Okay. In molar pregnancy, hydropic degeneration will be more. It will be highly differentiated since you show trophoblastic marked diffuse proliferation will be there. Here it will be simply focal proliferation. So you will see the baby also and you will see some focal uh, proliferation of the placental tissue also. There will be no fetal parts, no blood vessels, scalloping will be absent, inclusion bodies will be absent. And there is one more thing which is absent here that is immunostaining with P57 KIP2. That is something you need to memorize. This question has already come. Immunostaining with P57 KIP2 is basically a pathology thing. It is a pathology. Uh, pathologists will tell you whether the staining is positive. It is positive because it is the maternal genome which is causing this to become positive. In complete mole, it is absent because the maternal genome is inactive. So, scalloping is not there in complete mole. Immunostaining with P57 is absent and there is no inclusion body also. These are the differences, okay? Then what else? Theca lutein cells will be absent in uh, partial mold because the HCG level is low. The uh, TVS will resemble a missed abortion because you can see the baby also and you can see some placental hydropic degeneration also combined together. 3 to 5 percent chances of GTN here. Here it is 15 to 20 percent chances of GTN. 4 percent can become choriocarcinoma. Here only less than 1 percent can become choriocarcinoma. So HCG has to be monitored monthly not weekly. Okay. Monthly monitoring is enough in partial mold. In complete mole, it is a snowstorm appearance. We know that snowstorm appearance. Dr. Abhishek will cover it in sonography findings. That live session is due. It will be happening very soon. Levels of HCG will be high. Theca lutein cells will be present because they mimic LH and they will cause excessive proliferation of the theca cells of the ovary. Sorry for the camera. It's just kind of sliding again and again. All right. Okay. So immunostaining will be negative here because it's an empty ova. Right. Easy to remember. Everything is present in partial mole. Everything is absent in complete mole. It is a triploidy. It is a diploidy. Okay. 80% of the H moles resolve with treatment. 15% will be persist as invasive, persistent or residual mole. 5% will develop into choriocarcinoma. So, 4% to 5% will develop into choriocarcinoma. 85% will resolve on their own. But 15% may become invasive. They may become like an invasive, locally invasive or persistent mole. What can happen? Complications in complete mole. Tell me. Complications will be PIH again. 
um, because uh, continuous proliferation of the placenta because we know it's a defective placenta which leads to PIH. So in mold because it is a placental proliferation, it's a placental tumor which is happening. So PIH can happen even before 20 weeks. Then excessive HCG will lead to hyperemesis gravidarum, uh, thyrotoxicosis because it can mimic TSH also, it can mimic LH also. Okay, and respiratory distress because these vesicles can escape into the venous circulation of the uh, the uh, pulmonary circulation. It, it, it can enter the veins, the sinuses and it can lead to PE. Then, suction evacuation is the gold standard. They will ask you what is the gold standard treatment that is suction and evacuation. Followed by prophylactic chemotherapy in selected cases, routinely not required 80 to 95 percent regress after dilatation and evacuation. Partial mode only suction evacuation is necessary chemotherapy is not needed remember very important in partial mole if in the question they had asked you chemotherapy option you will not take that okay you can do an hcg level measurement every month so that you know that it is regressing but you don't need to give chemotherapy because the malignant potential and the potential of uh, persisting is very very low chemotherapy methotrexate in a molar pregnancy is given only once a day oh, sorry it is given only for one day and it is five times a day it has to be repeated 7 to 10 days, 3 courses. So, for example, 1st April, you are given 5 doses in 1 day. Then you call her again on 8th April and then you call her again on 15th April. So, every 7 days you are calling her for 3 courses. Total 3 courses in complete mode. Why I am writing this? Because it is slightly different in the choriocarcinoma regimen. Now, answer this question for me. A 26-year-old, yes, the alpha subunit. You are right, the beta subunit is, uh, is different, the alpha subunit is common. That is why we do a beta HCG whenever we have to check for any particular hormone which are kind of similar, HCG, LS, we do the beta subunit so that we know that we are checking the right hormone. 26 year old lady with mild bleeding per vaginum, 10 weeks history of amenorrhea. So, 2 and a half months pregnant, pregnancy test positive, ultrasound shows fetus, no heartbeat, placental mass with cystic areas. Till now, we know it is a partial mole of 2 and a half months pregnancy. HCG level was higher than the as compared to the normal at that gestation again confirms molar pregnancy. She underwent suction and evacuation which is the gold standard treatment. Products of conception were seen and sent for histopathology. What can you expect? Can you expect area stellar reaction? Can you expect absence of villi? Absence of villi are seen where? If they are seen in? Tell me, I am not writing this. Retained products of conception will you see without any hydropic changes or you will see hydropic degeneration with immunostaining and PH57. Very good Ashutosh. It is hydropic degeneration with immunostaining P57, KIP2 positive. I just told you because in partial mole, the maternal genome is inducing this hormone, this enzyme and that is why it is showing a staining positive. Area stella is she seen in ectopic. Because the pregnancy is not in the uterus, but because of the progesterone and HCG, there are some changes in the endometrium. Absence of villi is seen in choriocarcinoma. It is not a case of choriocarcinoma. Retained products of conception with no hydropic changes is a normal pregnancy. Normal missed abortion. They have already told you it is a partial mole. You can easily make out from the question it is a partial mole. So, the answer is hydropic degeneration with immunostaining positive. Okay. We have done this. Now, we have already done and discussed this. Okay. Then coming to recap of the theory, GTN. The most common GTN which develops after molar pregnancy is invasive mole. Remember, it is not choriocarcinoma. The most common neoplasia which can develop after a complete mole is invasive mole. The most common GTN which develops after normal delivery is choriocarcinoma. But retrospectively, the most mostly the choriocarcinoma will develop after molar pregnancy. So, most of the molar pregnancies if, if, you, if they ask you what is the most common neoplasia which develops after molar pregnancy is actually invasive mole. But retrospectively, if you see a choriocarcinoma, she will have an antecedent pregnancy which was a molar pregnancy. But if a normal de delivery patient has to develop a choriocarcinoma or a GTN, it will be choriocarcinoma or PSTT. Okay, understood the difference? PSTT most commonly develops after full term pregnancy. So, the most common GTN after normal delivery is choriocarcinoma. That is number one and the second one is PSTT. But generally it is after the molar pregnancy which uh, develops into choriocarcinoma. Hi Isha. Okay, age of the female, the risk factors for developing a GTN that is gestational trophoblastic neoplasia is age of the female more than 40, beta HCG more than 1 lakh, uterine size larger than the gestational age, bilateral theca lutein cyst more than 6 centimeters. These are all the indications which we read in indications of chemotherapy also. So, these are the risk factors when the molar pregnancy can develop into GTN. 
it can be chorio carcinoma it can be invasive mole it can be pstt so these are the risk factors and that is why these are the risk factors for chemotherapy also the indications for chemotherapy also and there is a slow decline either the beta hcg is plateauing or it is increasing okay so that is how we come to know that these are the risk factors and this patient needs chemotherapy what are the lab criteria very important i would label it as very important because i have seen these questions coming although i have not been able to pick up that question for you here now what are the lab criteria after molar pregnancy after evacuation for the diagnosis of gtn so these are the risk factors but what are the factors the lab criteria which will tell you okay she is developing gtn one is you do a histopathological examination of the uh, tissue and it comes back as gtn okay that is confirmatory but what are the other things either you do a hcg value four consecutive hcg values at day 1 7 14 and 21 so for four weeks you did every week you did a hcg value and it was either showing a plateauing or less than 10% decrease so either it is showing like this it is increasing or it is decreasing or it is just simply plateauing so less than 10% decrease or you did a three consecutive values of hcg day 1 7 and 14 and there is more than 10% increase in the previous value so either increasing like this or it is plateauing here or it is decreasing less than 10% decrease beta hcg remains above normal even after 6 months so either it is showing an increasing trend or it is showing a plateauing or even if it is decreasing it is very very less decrease almost a flat line or even if it is showing a decrease but even after 6 months you continuously monitoring her it is not coming back to normal it is not coming back to less than 5 that means she is developing gtn okay Corio carcinoma locally invasive as well as it can metastasize. Now, corio carcinoma is the only GTN gestational trochoplastic neoplasia which can metastasize to the entire body. It can go to brain, lungs, liver, spleen, everywhere, vagina also. Most common route of metastasis here is hematogenous. The most common site is lungs in 80 percent. Vagina is only 30 percent, and that is subureteral. That is just below the ureteral opening, and pelvis can be 20 percent. Vaginal metastasis is seen in stage two. There is a question on staging also. Ashutosh yes it should be done weekly in molar pregnancies complete mole because if they are high risk then it has to be done weekly if it is a partial mole it is it, it has to be done monthly that is the reason why they have written this weekly day 1 day 7 day 14 day 21 day 1 7 14 so this is how they monitor the complete mole pregnancy especially if it's a high risk one okay high risk because she is having his age is more than 40 hcg is high tlc is high uterus size is high beta hcg is not coming down right now most common route of metastasis is hematogenous the most common uh, site is lung followed by vagina and then pelvis vaginal metastasis is stage 2 i will come to the stage most common site is sub urethral metastasis answer this question for me very very simple do you remember the staging of corio carcinoma a case of gestation trophoplastic neoplasm is seen in the lungs what is the staging 1 2 3 4 very simple if you remember the staging okay stage 3 is the answer that is correct lung is seen in stage 3 very good ashutosh abdul pritam yes so stage 1 is uterus stage 2 is outside the uterus but within the pelvis means it's pelvis or vagina stage 3 is lungs and stage 4 is other organs liver git brain and if you remember the who scoring liver spleen git every everyone has a different score so i'm not going to repeat that scoring but i will show you on the screen so that you just uh, remember what you have learned and take a print out of this particular scoring the who scoring is very very important and they might ask you to score it they might ask you the treatment so you need to know the scoring by heart so take out print outs and put it in your bedroom wherever you sleep in the washroom where you brush your teeth so that whenever you get up wherever you pass that area there are certain tables that you need to know the stagings this is very important who scoring now stage 1 is low risk we know that stage 4 is high risk okay stage 1 is only uterus and stage 4 is um, liver git all the intestinal the intra abdominal organs okay now what about stage 2 and 3 stage 2 is pelvis vagina stage 3 is lungs how do we know whether it is low risk or high risk in that case we need the who classification why is who classification given why would, don't we just manage according to the staging because stage 2 and stage 3 are confusing we don't know whether it is high risk or low risk so that is why we need to know the who scoring in vagina the most common area of metastasis is subureteral which is very vascular and bleeds profusely stage 3 is chest presentation lungs how will they present they will either show a snowball um a snowstorm appearance just like sonography of the uterus or there may be a cannon ball appearance a cannon ball appearance that is a focal um, growth within the lungs that is showing you the gtn meta, uh, the metastasis and the symptoms here will be cough and hemoptysis right now scoring 
you want me to uh, do the scoring i think it will be just a waste of time because it is just a copy of what is written in your books how will i remember if, if i was a student what will i do i will just first, first of all tick mark the the criteria which are not going up to score four so there are six criteria out of nine so out of nine so this is sorry this is one this is two this is three this is four right then five then 6, then 7, then 8 and 9. So you can see after out of 9, there are, sorry, yeah, out of 9, there are 6 criteria in which all the 4 scores are not being used. So 0, 1, 2 and 4. There is no scoring like 3 and it starts from 0, ends at 4. So there are four, 6 scores, 6 criteria where all the scores are not used. Age, it is only 0 and 1 being used. In... Uh, Antecedent pregnancy, it is only 0, 1 and 2 being used, so this one. Then here, it is largest tumor including uterus, less than 3, 3 to 4, more than 5. Then number of metastasis can be 1 to 4, 5 to 8, more than 8. So remember, 0 is not being used because number of metastasis can never be, it can never be 0. If metastasis is there, it cannot be 0, okay. Largest tumor size, it has never gone up to score 4. Blood group, it starts with 1. It's either O or A, it's 1, 2 is B and AB, nothing like 4. And prior failed chemotherapy. So, single drug and more than 2 drugs. So, this is how I will remember. 6 out of 9 are not using all the 4 scores. The rest 3 are using all the 4 scores. So, you need to remember 6 up to 6 is low risk. 7 and higher is high risk. Okay. And how do you decide single uh, dose or um, multiple dose chemotherapy? Low risk is single dose, uh, methotrexate. How do you give it? 1, 3, 5 and 7. So, from 1 till 8 day, you are giving methotrexate. Alternate day, you are giving folinic acid. Because methotrexate is causing toxicity, you need to give folinic acid. In case the patient's liver is damaged and she is having jaundice, in that case, instead of methotrexate, you give actinomycin D. That was again a question which I saw in the groups where, where one of the students had asked. I don't have the question right now. But yes, they will ask you, instead of methotrexate, what is the uh, substitute for methotrexate if the patient has jaundice? Then it is actinomycin D. So, in complete mold, when we were giving chemotherapy, we were giving methotrexate 5 times a day. 5 times a day. And we were giving it on day 1, day 7 and day, uh, day 8, sorry, after every 7 days and day 50. 3 cycles. Here we are giving it, first cycle is finishing in 8 days. So, from 1st April till 8th April, for example. Then you again start from 15th April to 22nd April. Then again you start from 23. So, this is how it goes, 23 to 30th April. So, this is how every week you are giving, you, you are giving her one week rest in between and you are giving her three cycles of methotrexate plus folinic acid, 1357 and 2468. This is how we do it. They will ask you the dose, methotrexate is 1 to 1.5 milligram per kg. So, on an average, we will give 50 milligram to the patient who, because averagely the women are 50 to 60 mg, uh, kilogram in weight. So, we will give them 50 milligram that is easily available in the market and the next day we will give a folinic acid. Okay, folinic acid is 0.1 milligram per kg per day and this is 0.1 1 to 1.5 milligram per kg. IM, it has to be given, methotrexate. Okay, if the female doesn't desire fertility, you may do a hysterectomy and give her chemotherapy. Repeat this course every 7 days till the HCG comes back normal, less than 5. Follow her up for 3 more cycles of chemotherapy after the uh, value normalizes and follow the patient for 1 year. You have to follow her up for 1 year. Very important. You have to follow this patient for 1 year. Okay. In molar pregnancy, you don't need to follow for 1 year. You have given methotrexate because the HCG levels were high and the HCG has come back to normal. The previous 2 values were normal. So, then you can just leave her. But in choriocarcinoma, you have to follow her up for 1 year. Answer this question. Now, we have moved to CIN and cervical cancer. Now, what are the ACOG and ASCCP guidelines for age-related cervical screening? More than 65 years, less than 21 years, 21 to 65 and teenagers. Tell me. What is the answer here? Okay, yeah, you're right, Ashutosh. Abdul, yes, it is 21 to 65. Let us just recapitulate what we have read before. PAP screening guidelines by ACCP revised by ACOG in 2013. Remember the year also, 2013. You may get confused sometimes. When we are actually uh, sitting and doing the MCQs, I don't, we don't know where our brain is running. And sometimes even simple things might confuse us. So, 2013, it was revised by ACCP. That is American Society for Colposcopy and Cervical Pathology, American College of Gynecology. Okay, 
ट्वेंटी वन ईयर्स ऑफ एज रिगार्डलेस ऑफ द एज ऑफ फर्स्ट सेक्शुअल इंटरकोर्स अमेरिकन गाइडलाइंस बिकॉज द सेक्शुअल एक्टिविटी इज मच बिफोर दैन द इंडियन गाइडलाइंस सो द डब्ल्यू एच ओ हैज कम अप विद अ न्यू गाइडलाइन डब्ल्यू एच ओ सेज इन रिसोर्स पुअर कंट्रीज विद द सेक्शुअल एक्टिविटीज नॉट एज मच एज कम्पेयर टू द वेस्टर्न पॉपुलेशन दे हैव सेट दैट यू कैन स्टार्ट स्क्रीनिंग एट थर्टी इन अमेरिका बाई ट्वेंटी वन दे एक्सेप्ट दैट मोस्ट ऑफ द फीमेल्स विल बी सेक्शुअली एक्टिव इन दैट केस यू हैव टू स्टार्ट द स्क्रीनिंग इर रेस्पेक्टिव वेदर शी वॉज सेक्शुअली एक्टिव एट द एज ऑफ फिफ्टीन और सिक्सटीन बट फ्रॉम ट्वेंटी वन ऑनवर्ड यू हैव टू स्टार्ट द स्क्रीनिंग नॉट बिफोर दैट बिकॉज देन शी विल बी वेरी यंग फॉर दिस काइंड ऑफ स्क्रीनिंग इन केस शी हेज नॉट बीन सेक्शुअली एक्टिव टिल ट्वेंटी वन देन यू हैव टू वेट टिल शी बिकम सेक्शुअली एक्टिव यू हैव टू वेट फॉर थ्री ईयर्स आफ्टर द फर्स्ट इंटरकोर्स देन यू डू अ पैप्स मेयर इट टेक्स अबाउट थ्री ईयर्स फॉर एनी थिंग एनी थिंग टू डेवलप इन विद इन द सर्विक्स आफ्टर सिक्सटी फाइव ईयर्स सो बेसिकली ट्वेंटी वन टू सिक्सटी फाइव इज ए एस सी सी पी एंड ए सी ओ जी After 65, they say that if the patient never had a history of CIN, you can stop it. Or if she had CIN, but the three consecutive Pap smears, every three years you're doing it. So almost nine years. The last nine years, three Pap smears, three three yearly Pap smears were normal. Or the core testing, which is done every five years. So last ten years, two tests were normal. In that case, you can just leave it. Core testing is HPV DNA with Pap smear. You know that, right? Women with prior treatment. of cin2 cin3 uh, adenocarcinoma in c2 cs survey so these are the high high uh, risk ones they have to be followed for at least 20 years okay so in cin when it is hsil or full blown cervical carcinoma adenocarcinoma the patient has to be followed up for uh, for 20 years so this is the asccb guideline pap screening for uh, again uh, by asccb it says after hysterectomy for benign disease no screening is required after hysterectomy for hsil If it has been LSIL, what will you do? They don't say anything about LSIL, but for LSIL, you may do a Pap. Maybe if after six months, if it is normal, you can leave it. You can maybe just follow her for one year, LSIL. But in HSIL, you have to follow her up for twenty years. If you can remember, six monthly in the first two years, and then followed by every three years, just like the normal routine, you do a Pap smear every three years. From the vaginal cuff, you do a, a Pap three yearly, and you have to monitor her for twenty years because she has had his uh, HSIL, that is high grade lesion. If HPV vaccine has already been given, don't get confused. The screening has to be continued. HPV vaccine is not going to reduce the uh, the chances of she getting infected. It is going to reduce the chances of she getting uh, integrated with HPV and developing a high grade lesion. Okay, so HPV vaccine is protecting 99% of the cancers and high grade lesions because it is a vaccine acting against the virus. But it will not it will not prevent infection. So you have to do the routine screening and treat her. then hpv testing when is it recommended it is recommended after 30 because before 30 we assume that the sexual activity is more hpv keeps coming and going and the immunity of the patient is very good at that time less than 30 the integration with hpv will not happen the body will automatically remove the hpv from the body so it has to be done after 30 pap smear with high risk hpv testing is known as co testing if it is done combined then you don't have to do it every 3 years you do it every 5 years Uh, basically you are trying to protect your resources you are trying not to use your resources so much don't exploit the resources so it is not recommended in less than 30 years in cases of abnormal pap reports in cases of untreated cin or in cases of post treatment surveillance also depends upon what kind of question they are asking sometimes the option may be hpv testing after treatment of cin2 sometimes it might be colposcopy so it all depends how the question is framed there is a question i'll just come to that now it's unnecessary hpv testing is unnecessary in cases with typical warts when you can see that high grade lesion is there cervical cancer is there or warts have developed what will you do by getting hpv dna testing you know it is hpv okay co testing if it is negative it has a high negative predictive value so you can wait for 5 years it is said 5 to 10 years because it depends upon the kind of population we are dealing with the resources available but generally 5 years for uh, uh, co testing and in hiv positive it is 3 years so remember 3 years and 5 years although the range is 5 to 10 and 3 to 5 but 5 years for co testing in a normal patient and a patient who is hiv positive or living with a hiv positive partner then it can be 3 years who says that for resource poor countries where the patients are that population is too high the resources are poor we cannot do uh, so much triage and so much testing then you have to just see and treat whatever you have diagnosed just treat so you have to start the screening at 30 and stop at 50 don't do it uh, uh, after 40 50 okay so if living with hiv positive patient then you can start with at 25 years otherwise start at 30 stop at 50 if previous two screenings were normal just like what we did previously in 65 years of age in acog it says previous three screenings means previous last 10 years screenings were normal whether two co testing or three simple pap but here 
stop screening at 50 if previous two screenings were normal. Now, WHO, I'm not going to the details. It is, it is saying that you can either do a C and treat approach or you can do a C triage and treat approach. So basically, it depends upon what kind of resources and what kind of patient um, uh, population you are dealing with. Okay. Now, primary test can be HPV DNA or VIA. So VIA is visual inspection, which is done in the villages by the nurses. Just apply 5% acetic acid. If it is coming up, popping up white, then you may do a biopsy. You may send her for further treatment. You may do a cryo. You may do a cautery. So see and treat. Just one test and you treat. Okay. After treatment, you have to follow her up for one year. So HPV DNA, if it is positive, treat it. VIA, if it is positive, treat it. The other uh, approach is much better that is C triage and treat what it says is don't just treat immediately you have seen just one thing so do another another test no why just see a VIA that it is coming up white popping up and then you are treating it no don't do that do HPV DNA or do VIA and then if one is positive do another test so do do HPV DNA followed by VIA or VIA followed by HPV if both are positive then you go for either colposcopy you you send her for biopsy, you send her for cryotherapy or whatever, okay. So, HPV plus VIA is better than simply one test and of course, HPV DNA is much better if the resources are there and the patient can afford. Primary test PAP or HPV DNA, then you can do another test that is triage, see triage and treat. This was something new in Williams. Um, so, that is why you need to know this. Now, solve this question for me. 30-year-old woman is diagnosed with carcinoma in situ of the cervix and no obvious macroscopic growth. What is the next line of management? Tell me. So, is it hysterectomy? Is it conization? Is it colposcopy and biopsy? Or is it follow up after 6 months? What will you do here? Tell me. She is 30, she is young, okay. She has been diagnosed with carcinoma in situ, so that means HSIL. There is no obvious macroscopic growth. You cannot see any growth. What will, be, what will you do? Okay, so D and C. Somebody is saying follow up after 6 months. Why will you follow up after 6 months, Preetam? Uh, you cannot leave a patient with carcinoma in situ. You have to treat her, right? You will not do a hysterectomy in a 30-year-old patient. You will not follow her up for 6 months unless you treat her. So, the option can be either conization, colposcopy, and biopsy. So, I will go with colposcopy and biopsy here. Why not conization? Somebody will say, why not conization, ma'am? Because the carcinoma in situ has been diagnosed. But did they tell you that it, it was a biopsy diagnosis? It might be just a pap diagnosis. So, you have to confirm that it is definitely carcinoma in situ. So, colposcopy has to be done. Even conization, a blind conization is never done. It was done maybe when our consultants were working. Maybe, say for example, I finished in 2000, the, my PG. So, uh, another 20 years back. So, that was long back when colposcopy was not available. At that time, we were doing cold knife conization. Simply going with the knife and cutting a cone outside, uh, cutting a cone like this. But now, we do everything with colposcopy. So, the best answer is colposcopy and biopsy. Okay. Then, next question. A 30-year-old woman came with cervical discharge, pelvic pain. These are the two complaints. She is again young. Pap smear is showing LSIL. So, it is LSIL through pap smear. How will you manage the patient? What will you do now? So, it is LSIL. You will repeat the pap. You will do a hysterectomy. You do colposcopy biopsy. You do a colon biopsy. Tell me. And also tell me if the patient was 60 with post bleeding, what will you do? What if the patient had ASCUS instead of uh, LSIL? How does the management change? First of all, answer this question. So, young patient having cervical discharge and has been diagnosed with LSIL, which is very common. Low grade uh, CIN1, it, it, is, it is a low grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. What will you do? Anybody? We are taking so much time. Come on, Ashutosh. Come on, Preetam. Who else was answering, Abdul? Isha, Akshat. Okay. Ashutosh is saying A, Preetam is saying A, okay. Yes, I know it is confusing because you know that most of the LSIL will actually go away on their own. 60%, 70% will regress 
but you can't leave an LSIL when the report has come. So you have to do a colposcopy plus minus biopsy. You may not do a biopsy if you are sure in colposcopy that this looks like a normal lesion. But you cannot uh, diagnose just by looking at it. You have to do a biopsy. Generally, colposcopy with biopsy is the uh, recommended treatment for LSIL also. So I'll come to that chart as to how you manage as per the PAP report. Okay. Now, if this patient was 60 instead of 30 and instead of cervical discharge, she was having postcoital bleeding. Or she may be having just simply cervical discharge. You will not uh, believe. I just recently, six months ago, I uh, had a patient of around uh, 55, 60 years. She had excessive cervical discharge. And um, by just looking at her, she did not look cancerous. She looked absolutely normal. There was no abnormal bleeding. But looking at the cervix, it was unhealthy. And it was a very foul smelling discharge. There was no growth. So I just did a biopsy and it came back as a very early cervical carcinoma. So yes, if it, uh, it is a patient with LSIL. But she's 60 with postcoital bleeding. Sorry, sorry for this. Uh, 60 with postcoital bleeding, the answer will be hysterectomy. Here, the answer will be hysterectomy. Okay. But if the patient had ascus and pap, it was what not LSI, it was ascus. In that case, you will follow her up, repeat a pap smear after six months. Do you understand? Ascus, LSI, HSI, they all have different uh, ways of managing. So, depending upon the age, depending upon the pap finding, you will manage the patient. But if the patient was 60, with ASCUS, see, follow her up with pap smear after 6 months, okay. Sometimes you may do a colposcopy with biopsy in 60 year old depending upon what all symptoms she is having. If she is having symptoms, why will you do a pap in a 60 year old? She will have symptoms, then only you will do. So the option will be either repeat pap or you do a colposcopy biopsy that comes back ASCUS, then you repeat a pap after 6 months, okay. Understood? How you approach a question? Now, approach to this question is cervical discharge, pelvic pain, LSIL, yes, LSIL I told you. Repeat PAP after 6 months. Once the diagnosis is confirmed, again repeat cytology after 1 year. That is done. Basically, once you have diagnosed with colposcopy in LSIL, that yes, it is CIN1. So, the answer is colposcopy with or without biopsy. That is recommended. Cone biopsy we will not do in this case because to remove a cone, it is very extensive surgery. Very uh, hemorrhagic. It can lead to a lot of bleeding. So, we will not do in a LSIL. Hysterectomy not recommended unless the patient is... Um, postmenopausal and she's completed her family and that too it is a persistent LSIL then you will do it why will you do a hysterectomy even in a 50 year old patient even uh, I mean now the patients are very very uh, kind of conscious about their uterus about everything they don't just want to get anything removed because they have stopped conceiving they don't want any more children that doesn't mean that the uterus can be removed okay so coming to management of CIN as per the PAP report very important ask us only 5 to 10 percent chance of converting ASCUS to CIN23, that is HSIL. Very, very rarely it will convert into HSIL. Cancer is seen only in 0.1 percent, 1 to 2 out of 1000. Age 21 to 24 in ASCUS. You will just simply repeat PAP. If it is abnormal, then you go for colposcopy. So repeat PAP after 6 months. Right? If she is more than 25, you may go for HPV DNA testing. So in this case, our patient was. 30 year old so if it was ask us you may do if, if there was a, uh, an option here hpv reflex testing what is reflex and what is hpv do you know the difference hpv core testing is when you are doing a pap smear and you're requesting the pathologist to do a pap along with hpv testing at the same go reflex testing is when the report comes back pap is positive showing hsil showing some reactive changes coelocytes are there and then the pathologist requests you that can i add hpv test to this that is reflex testing it's one and the same thing the only thing is as a gynecologist you have not requested hpv initially so that is not uh, co-testing if, if the pathologist tells you there's a problem now you um, uh, ask her to do or ask the pathologist to do the reflex testing now or hpv testing on the same sample that becomes a reflex testing Okay, difference between reflex and the co-testing. So, that is it. So, combined testing after 3 years, you may be done. It may be done. Reflex DNA testing can be done after 25 years if the patient is having ASCUS. And if it is positive, then we may do a colposcopy. HS LSIL, the growth is visible, you will do a punch biopsy. Generally, growth is not visible in LSIL. So, if it is not visible, you do a colposcopic guided biopsy. You may do an endocervical puritage if you cannot see the transformation zone. Or you may see a glandular abnormality, you may do an endocervical curettage. Confirm CIM with colposcopy, then you follow up after 6 months and co-testing HPV DNA 12 months. So basically LSIL should be followed up for 1 year only. LSIL, ASCUS, 1 year follow up is enough. 
एच एस आई एल कार्सिनोमा इंस्टीट्यूट ट्वेंटी ईयर्स फॉलो अप इवन द यूट्रस इज रिमूव यू फॉलो अप विद पैप एवरी थ्री ईयर्स फॉर ट्वेंटी ईयर्स ओके इन एडोलिसेंस ओनली एनुअल पैप इज रिकमेंडेड ओनली एनुअल पैप इज रिकमेंडेड इन एडोलिसेंस नो या then coming to 21 to 24 and more than 25 just like ask us if she is young very young less than 25 colposcopy may not be indicated you may simply leave co testing also we don't need to do hpv testing as i told you hpv is recommended only after 30 post menopausal women colposcopy is indicated repeat cytology at 6 to 12 months hpv testing cin1 is persisting after 2 years you may do a cryo although cin1 doesn't need any treatment but sometimes you may do a cryo in pregnant females you may wait for 6 weeks pregnancy with cervical carcinoma i have not included in this particular chapter in this particular session but yes you can uh, go through my lectures in manipal medes you can go through the free uh, sessions you can go subscribe to it if you want to know the details so pregnancy depends upon what week gestation of pregnancy she has been diagnosed with cervical uh, problems whether it is lsil whether it is hsil whether it is carcinoma in situ or micro invasive or macro invasive carcinoma so it all depends upon the gestation the type of report and of course the maturity of the baby now hsil the dictum says it has to be colposcopy and biopsy a punch biopsy if the growth is visible using titular forceps i have not included the photograph of titular forceps but you should know how it looks like and it may be colposcopic directed biopsy with endocervical curettage if required biopsy there was a question whether it requires anesthesia no it does not require anesthesia and what are the agents which will reduce bleeding in uh, in case of uh, biopsy when you are doing a biopsy the bleeding um, can be reduced with the help of silver nitrate or ferric subsulfate these are the solutions that can be put on the cervix so that the local he hemostasis can be prevented sometimes we even have to take a stitch practical experience i'm telling you sometimes if the mass is very very friable and the packing is not helping you you are packing with ferric sub subsulfate or monsal solution or uh, silver nitrate even then it is not working you may need to have a, take a stitch or sometimes even uh, you may need to do a cautery recurrent hsil you will do a hysterectomy especially if she has completed her family cone excision leap biopsy leap is basically a loop attached to the a tungsten loop or a stainless steel wire it is attached to the stick and it is attached to the cautery and you cut that lesion now answer this question for me a 40 year old woman presents for routine gynecological examination she has a history of hpv infection and cin2 that was treated with loop electrosurgical excision procedure leap 2 years ago on pelvic examination there is a small area of edema on the cervix the most appropriate management at this time is what she is 40 she is not that young she is not that old history of hpv she has been treated with leap cin2 uh, was diagnosed 2 years ago it was done now there is a small area of edema what will you do it is simply edema will you just simply observe and repeat pap in 6 months will you do an hpv testing will you do a colposcopy or will you do a biopsy i give you 20 seconds okay so what answers do we have d and c ashutosh and pritham okay so i will go with colposcopy here because she is showing a lesion you will not observe and repeat pap smear in 6 months she has come to you with edema there is maybe a recurrence there it's a cin2 right and you are following her for 2 20 years so within 2 years if she is coming back you have to do something so definitely not observe definitely Mm, not biopsy why will you do a biopsy without a colposcopy so colposcopy plus minus biopsy if it is required and there is a confusion between hpv dna testing in this case because they are telling that there is a uh, erythema there so first you do a colposcopy if you think hpv dna testing is required you may do a colposcopy with uh, lbc again or a pap smear again and then you can send the sample for hpv testing because she is above 40 so, so yes hpv testing can be done but the first thing will be colposcopy 40 year old woman giving a history treatment and edema on the cervix observation and repeat pap smear can be done only once she is completely treated so in cin2 you have to follow her for 20 years so you can't just observe hpv dna testing not 
recommended in treated CIN2. It may be done when you're following her up, but now she's come back with a problem. Corposcopy is better because LEAP sometimes can miss the microinvasive carcinoma. The microinvasive carcinoma, LEAP can, uh, LEAP can miss it. So, in suspicious examination, corposcopy with biopsy is very important. Naked eye biopsy, we don't do anymore. Now, again, coming to the cervical cancer staging. The cervical cancer staging, very, very important. One second. Yeah. Stage 0 is CIN3 and carcinoma in C2 where the basement membrane is intact. Stage 1 is strictly confined to the cervix. Stage 1A, 1A1 and 1A2. So, 1A is always microscopic and 1B is macroscopic. So, microscopic carcinoma, less than 5 millimeter deepest invasion, three, less than 3 and 3 to 5. So, I'm just recapitulating what you have read. I'm not going to the details because it's just something you need to remember. There's no rocket science in it, okay? So, when it is less than 3 millimeter, that is A1 and A2 is between 3 to 5. Both are microscopic. In that case, you will simply do a conization or type 1 hysterectomy, TAH. You may not do a BSO. Simply TAH, total abdominal hysterectomy. It doesn't need a radical hysterectomy till stage A1, A1, less than 3 millimeter. As soon as it becomes 1A2, it is radical trachelectomy or a type 2, type 3, vardaim or radical hysterectomy. It means it is still microscopic, but it is more than the pathologist is saying, more than um, 3 millimeter microinvasion, then you go for a radical hysterectomy. But we don't do a pelvic lymphadenectomy in the first case. Second one, we are doing it. Remember, in stage 1, because it is microscopic, because it is a microscopic carcinoma, we don't give radiotherapy. So, in cervical cancer, stage 1A in microscopic carcinoma, no radiotherapy, lymphadenectomy not done in 1A1, but it is done in 1A2. But if it in 1A1, it becomes LVSI positive, the pathologist is good enough to tell you that lymph vascular space involvement is there. Then in that case, you have to do a pelvic and paraiotic lymph node dissection, just like you did in endometrial carcinoma stage 2, when it went to the cervix. You did a paraiotic as well as pelvic, both lymphadenectomy. In that, in this case now, because LVSI is positive, you do a radical trachelectomy, radical hysterectomy, radical trachelectomy. Trachelectomy means removing only the cervix. Radical means parametrium along the cervix. Not the uterus, but parametrium, which is on the side of the cervix. So, remove that. Cervical conization may be done and type 3 hysterectomy may be done. Okay. Now, coming to stage 1B, it is macroscopic now. B1, B2 and B3. B1 is less than 2, B2 is 2 to 4 and more than 4. So, from B3 onwards... Once the tumor is more than 4 cm, we don't do any surgery. No surgery. No surgery after the tumor becomes more than 4 cm. No radiotherapy till it is 1A. Means it is microscopic. Okay. So, clinically visible, stromal invasion has to be more than 5 because is now it is 1B, more than 1A. And preclinical size, but the size has to be more than 1A. So, less than 2, 2 to 4, more than 4. So, what is the, uh, the treatment here? 1B2, that means it is 2 to 4 centimeter because 1B1 is included here. 1B1 is here, ragged, radical trachelectomy because the size was less than 2 centimeter. Okay. Once it is between 2 to 4, we do a type 2, that is Vardaim hysterectomy or a radical hysterectomy with the radiotherapy with pelvic lymphadenectomy, pelvic and paraiotic. Then coming to A2, A2 and 1B3, what is 2A1? 2 is basically cervix involving beyond the uterus but not till the pelvic wall. So, this is the uterus. This is the cancer here. It is spreading in the upper two-third of the vagina till here or it is going to the parametrium but it is not involving the lateral pelvic wall. So, this is the cancer. Let me use the green color here. This is the cancer here. So, this is stage 2. Stage 2A is when it is involving the upper two-third of the vagina without parametrial involvement. Stage 2B is parametrial involvement. Once the parametrial involvement is there, we don't do any surgery. Okay. So, 1B3 and 2A2, no surgery. No surgery because the size has increased. Even in 2A2, the size is more than 4 cm. Okay. So, 2A2, 2B, when the parametrium is involved and beyond 2B, we don't do any surgery. So, either size more than 4 cm or involvement of the parametrium, no surgery is recommended. So, in 1B3 and 2A2, the size is more than 4 cm. Simply radiotherapy, chemo radiation means you add cisplatin. Cisplatin is a key sensitizer, radio sensitizer, which increases the sensitivity of the cervical tissue to radiotherapy. Okay. So, cisplatin can be given. CCRT is combined chemotherapy and radiotherapy, palliative surgery or radiotherapy because now it is extending towards the pelvic wall involving the ureter. Then four will be rectum, bladder and the other organs. Recurrence pelvic exenteration has to be done in cases of recurrence if at all the patient can uh, tolerate it or it can be simply palliative radiotherapy. 
stage 2 we have done stage 3 will be extending to the lateral pelvic wall and the lower one third of the vagina so that is here we said it is not involving the lower one third now it has come to the lower one third of the vagina or it has extended till the pelvic wall that is stage 3 okay and stage 4 is beyond the true pelvis uh, that means adjacent organs bladder bowel and uh, rectum and then spread to the distant organs now answer this question for me 48 year old woman had a radical hysterectomy with for uh, sorry for a 6 cm squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix on final pathology report the parametric was seen to be free of tumor so no parametrial involvement so it is less than stage 2b 2b is what parametrial involvement and the size is 6 cm okay what stage is her cervical cancer is it 1b3 1b3 is above uh, 4 cm yes 1b3 or is it 2a it can't be 2a1 because it is less than 4 cm here it is 6 cm so what is the answer tell me it is definitely not 1b1 because 1b1 is less than 2 cm 1b2 is 2 to 4 cm it is either 1b3 or it can be 2a2 it cannot be 2b because there is no parametral involvement so now we are left with i have already given you the answer the answer is 2a2 it is 2a2 because it is 6 cm so more than 4 cm and no parametral involvement this is how they will ask you the questions okay Yes, Anil, it is C. Now, types of treatment available for cervical carcinoma. It is a very radiosensitive tumor. So, if the surgery is not possible or if surgery has to be combined, then radiotherapy is the first treatment. Chemo radiation is something new. That is, they are adding cisplatin to the radiotherapy treatment. No surgery once the tumor size is more than 4 cm, means 1B3 or the parametral involvement is there 2B. Okay. Radio sensitizer cisplatin increases the sensitivity of squamous cells for radiotherapy, chemo radiation. All stages are radio sensitive, but if the choice is there, that because the survival chances and the prognosis of surgery followed by surgery and radiotherapy is same, the results are same. So we will opt for surgery rather than radiotherapy because the, the complications are less. No radiotherapy beyond stage before stage 1B1. We know that radiotherapy is not given in microinvasive stage 1A. Okay. Then coming to primary nodes, secondary nodes and sentinel nodes. What, what do you mean by that? The primary nodes are the ones which will be involved first. Okay. Sentinel node is the most important or the first uh, lymph node to be involved. In vulval cancer and cervical cancer. Vulval cancer, it is the inguinal lymph node. And here it is the sentinel one is the ureteric. The para ureteric means just near the, uh, just near the cervix. That is a paracervical. The paracervical lymph node. Let me write it more clearly for you. Para cervical. You know cervix is here and the ureter is just here. So it will be a lymph node which is a part of the internal iliac lymph node, the hypogastric. But it is a para cervical or the uh, parametrial also. It is also known as the parametrial lymph node. Para cervical, parametrial and ureteric lymph node. This is the sentinel lymph node in cervical cancer. But the most commonly involved is the obturator lymph node. Don't get confused. Obturator lymph node is the most commonly involved. It is not the sentinel. The sentinel is the first one to get involved. That will be ureteric, paracervical or parametral. They are all the same. Inguinal lymph node is this one. Inguinal lymph node is the one which is involved, being involved in the vulval cancer. That is the sentinel lymph node. Primary nodes in cervical cancer or uterine cancer will be the parametral, paracervical, ureteric, internal iliac, obturator, external iliac, rectal and sacral. External iliac will come in the, sorry, common iliac will come in the secondary node. So, internal iliac, obturator and external iliac are the primary nodes. Common iliac, paraiotic, inguinal will come in the secondary node. And sentinel, I told you, this is the first lymph node to get involved. Answer this for me. 40-year-old woman comes with a history of post-coital bleeding and a visible mass seen on the cervix perspective. Very simple question. What should be the next step? You see a visible mass. She has come with post-coital bleeding. Will you do a conization? Will you go for cryo? Will you do a targeted biopsy or a pap smear? Come on, tell me. Simplest question that I can put up for you. Anil Singh B. Okay. Anybody else? Anyone else? It's definitely not B. Why will you jump into cryotherapy? Okay. 
Okay, I'm waiting for more answers. Somebody? It's a very simple question. Come on. It's a it's a visible mass seen on the cervix per speculum. What will you do? No way. No conization. Why will you jump into conization? It's a targeted biopsy. Come on. It's a targeted biopsy. You can see a growth here. You can see the cervix has a growth. So will you not just do a targeted biopsy? You don't even need a colposcopy here. Yes, thank you, Dr. Abirami. It is biopsy. It has to be biopsy, targeted biopsy. Because you can see it. So it's a titular forcep that you are using. Titular forcep, right? For the biopsy. Now, when a patient comes with postcortical bleeding, suspicion of cervical carcinoma, HSIL is high. If there is a visible mass, direct punch biopsy is done with the titular forcep or the lesion. If the lesion has endocervical uh, extent also, then you use a Carvokin curettage. It is something like this. That is endocervical curettage. Okay, you must have seen that. Biopsy should include some normal tissue also. Remember this very important question. If the lesion is this and this is the cervix here, you have to do a biopsy from the margins because the center might be necrotic. So, you have to take some normal tissue along with the necrotic tissue, along with the cancerous tissue. So, the biopsy has to be done from the uh, periphery so that the necrotic tissue is reduced. You get the cancerous tissue as well as the normal tissue so that you can compare the stroma of both and the depth of invasion can be seen. Sometimes tumorous tissue can be very, very necrotic so you have to take extra margins. Okay. Then coming to types of hysterectomies. As I told you, I will just uh, tell you quickly as to what these are. I am sure you know this. So if this is the uterus here, this is the pelvic wall. Okay. There is a ureter coming here and this is the parametric. Okay, so type 1 is extrafacial hysterectomy, which we do every day. Type 1 hysterectomy is extrafacial, and we do it from here. So, we cut it from here. Let me use a different type 1 hysterectomy is type 1 because it is piver and rutledge classification that is type 1. When it's quirlo and moro classification, it is type A. So, type 1 and type A are same, type 2 and type, type 2 and type B are same, and type 3 and type C are same. So, A, B, C, 1, 2, 3, that depends upon the classification that we are using. So, type 1 is when we are simply cutting near the uterus, not removing any part of the pyrometrium. Type 2, that is Bardines, will be medial to the ureter. So, we are pushing the ureter laterally and we are going, removing 50% of the pyrometrium. Type 3 is the radical hysterectomy, we are going up to the pelvic wall and we are protecting the ureter by dissecting it till the origin um, of the, of, we are protecting the uterine artery also because we are going till the end of the internal iliac artery where the origin of the uterine artery is happening. We are dissecting the ureter properly and pushing it towards the pelvic wall. So, we are just going towards the pelvic wall and removing everything that is type 3 radical hysterectomy. Now, important one-liners. Important one-liners for cervical cancer are most common cancer of cervix is the squamous cell carcinoma. Can you tell me what slide you are watching right now? Because uh, I can see on YouTube there is a lag. Uh, can you see the important one-liners? Can you give me a thumbs up? Because I feel there is a lot of lag here. You can see the important one lines, right? Okay. Thank you, KK. Okay. Most common cancer of the cervix is squamous cell carcinoma. Most common site will be transformation zone. Most common site for adenocarcinoma will be endocervix for cervical cancer. Most common lymph node involved, as I told you, will be obturator. But the sentinel lymph node is uretric, paracervical or it is also known as parametrial. Okay. Most common symptom in cervical cancer, that was my question when I was doing my PG, um, the PG third year exams. At that time, we did not have NEET or uh, NEET PG or NEXT. Uh, obviously, I was passing the, uh, the third year, the PG, uh, third year PG and the question thrown to me by the external examiner was the most common symptom in a cervical uh, carcinoma in situ and that is uh, the post bleeding and I kind of blabbered. I knew the answer and that was a topic of my thesis also, but I kind of blabbered because I was just so nervous. So, it is post-coital bleeding. Remember this. Generally, you will not see a lesion and the post-coital bleeding and foul-smelling discharge are the most common symptoms. Good evening, Rahul. Good evening. 
uh, yeah, postcoital bleeding KK. Most common site for metastasis is lymph nodes and the most common route of metastasis is lymphatics. Most common site of hematogenous spread is lungs. Most common cause of death, the most common is uremia or renal failure due to involvement of the ureter obstruction in stage 3 once it involves a pelvic wall. After that, the second cause can be hemorrhage. These are the two most important causes of death in cervical cancer. Now coming to uh, ovarian cancers. In patients with hereditary non-polyposis, colorectal cancer, HNPCC, the percentage risk of ovarian cancer and endometrial cancer respectively is how much? Okay, give me this answer. HNPCC is also known as Lynch 2 syndrome. This is Lynch 2 syndrome or also known as AD syndrome. They are all the same. In these syndromes, there is a gene which can lead to colorectal cancer, it can lead to endometrial cancer, it can lead to ovarian cancer. So, Rahul says it is D. Anybody else? Endometrial carcinomas will have certain uh, genes like, if one, one is this one, one is this syndrome, the second is Cowden and the third is BRCA. BRCA is as the name indicates, breast and ovary is more common here. Cowden will have more of endometrial, but maximally it will be Lynch 2. So, I will give you the answer. The answer is 12 and 50 percent respectively. 12 percent of ovarian cancers and 50 percent of endometrial cancers. So, let us quickly do the theory here. Hereditary non-polyposis, colorectal cancer, HNPCC, also known as Lynch 2 syndrome or AD syndrome. They have an overall, they have an overall lifetime risk of endometrial and ovarian cancer of 50 and 12 percent respectively. Most common cancer associated with HNPCC is colorectal cancer. Remember that HNPCC, the most common cancer is colorectal. It is not endometrial. But endometrial cancer is maximally seen in HNPCC when it comes to the comparison between Lynch, Cowden and BRCA. It occurs due to which mutation? Again, important for INSAID exams. MLH, MSH, MSH and PS, PMS. So, these are the uh, three Gs that, that you need to know. MLH1, MS, MSH2 and 6 and PMS2. These are the genes involved. Other uh, familial uh, genes or family history are Cowden syndrome and BRCA1 and 2. Cowden P10 gene, I told you, is a gatekeeper gene. It is a very good gene which is a gatekeeper and it protects the um, patients with endometrial cancer because it has a good prognosis. Okay, so 20 to 30 percent cases of endometrial cancer. P10 is known as gatekeeper gene for endometrial cancer as it is associated with good prognosis. BRCA1 and 2 most common is ovarian cancer. BRCA is ovarian cancer. It does not lead to that much of endometrial cancer. So, when it comes to the, uh, the decreasing order of these, then it is 50% Lynch, 30% Cowden and almost 1-2% to in BRCA. Coming to staging of ovarian cancer, let me just skip it because I want to do obstetrics now. It is almost about 2 hours. So, let me skip the ovarian cancer staging which you know very well. I am not going to do the staging with you. Stage 1, stage 4. Let us do this MCQ. A 45-year-old lady came to GOPD with pain abdomen and decreased appetite. You know the ovarian cancer will generally present with gastric symptoms. On pelvic examination, a 5 by 8 centimeter solid cystic mass was palpable in the left adnexa. If you are following me on Instagram, Dr. Sonal Parihar, that is my ID. I recently, just yesterday, operated on a case with such a big tumor solid cystic consistency and because it was having a high CA125, we had to do a staging laparotomy. So, what did I do? She is around 45, same age, same age, 45, okay. So, we did the staging laparotomy. So, staging laparotomy includes what? It includes hysterectomy, bilateral salpingo-ophrectomy, you have to do peritoneal washings, you have to take uh, the uh, diaphragmatic scrapings, you have to do the omental, omitectomy, not omental biopsy and then you have to send it for uh, checking whether the, it, there is a malignant ascites or not. So, in this case, she underwent staging laparotomy. Right ovary was found to be normal. Only the left ovary showed a solid cystic mass. Her peritoneal washings were sent for cytology, which came back positive. So, the cytology was positive, but the next ovary is not involved. So, answer according to Rahul is, I, ma'am, I got AIR 5000 in INS in November 20. What to study more in OBG for better rank? Okay. See, INSET, you know that the most high yield topics we know are in obstetrics. I will give you a list after we finish or maybe you can follow me on Instagram. I, I can make a reel for that. I have already told that in my Manipal uh, Medias lectures. You need to be like in depth with whatever you have studied. You got 5000 rank. That means you have, you have studied, you have revised. Only one month is left. You have to just revise the things and you have to go slightly more in depth for INSET. More of conceptual, more of clinical based questions and uh, yes you are right the answer is 
1c3 so let's not discuss this what are the high yield topics because it is very very important uh, for you to finish this uh, live session and do all the uh, the topics that we have decided so 1c3 is the answer because it is not involving the the next ovary so it is stage 1 and it is c3 because it is basically having peritoneal washings which are involved which are positive in ovarian cancer it's a recap when do we get uh, pelvic and paraiotic and inguinal lymph nodes okay pelvic in stage 2b paraiotic in stage 3a and inguinal in stage 4b just for you to remember this is just a recap of what i made i did not discuss the staging with you pelvic paraiotic inguinal okay so stage 2b 3a 4b inguinal lymph nodes in every genital cancer except for vulval are involved in stage 4b whether it's ovary endometrium cervix it's 4b 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 but in vulva it is stage 3a because inguinal lymph node drainage happens in vulval carcinoma earlier than the others. Uh, yes, Rahul, I am from Jodhpur. Thank you. You know me. I am from Sona Media Hospital. Okay. As I told you, staging laparotomy has to be a midline incision from the umbilicus till the pubic symphysis. Acytic fluid, if it is there, you send it for cytology. If it is not there, you do a peritoneal washing, saline wash. You take scrapings from the diaphragm, infracolic omentectomy has to be done, not omental biopsy. Remove the entire infracolic omentum and random peritoneal biopsies with TAH with BSO. Okay. Management of the ovarian cancer, fertility preserving surgery is done when? In ovarian cancers, when it is a germ cell tumor or a sex cord stromal tumor in a young female, they generally don't have a tendency to become bilateral. So, it can be done like a unilateral salpingovorectomy. So, that is, that is sorry, a fertility preserving surgery. Unilateral adenexectomy. Epithelial tumors when it is stage 1A means it is involving only one ovary and it is grade 1, well differentiated or grade 2 and it is a young patient, you may do a, a kind of uh, uh, fertility preserving surgery that is unilateral ophrectomy and borderline tumors, you don't need to remove the, both the ovaries. Now, stage 1A when it becomes grade 3, it has to be staging laparotomy, TAH, BSO, chemotherapy and the chemotherapy that we give for epithelial cancers is carboplatin, cisplatin, paxol, paclitexel. So, these are paclitexel and taxol is the same and we give it every 3 to 4 weeks total 6 cycles. This you need to know. It is paclitexel, cisplatin and carboplatin for epithelial. For uh, cases which are germ cell, it is BEP. It is BEP. I'll come to that. Advanced stages, you will do only debulking as much as you can remove and you give her chemotherapy. So, ovarian cancer is responsive to chemotherapy. Advanced stages will require these chemotherapeutic agents either before surgery or after surgery or it can be combined. It can be given intravenously or intra-abdominally. Now, bilateral ophrectomy reduces the risk of ovarian cancer by 96%. This is important. You may get it as an MCQ and breast cancer by 50 to 80%. So, if you do a bilateral ophrectomy in a patient who is BRCA positive, then it can prevent 96% of the ovarian cancers. But why 4% are left? Because even after removing the ovary, there can be a primary peritoneal carcinoma. And breast cancer by 50 to 80% can be reduced. <coughs> okay, Rahul. That's that's nice. Uh, it's good you are joining the session and uh, you're revising for your INS set. All the best. I hope you get a good rank and you get the dream college that you want. Okay. Now, new adjuvant chemotherapy. I request you all once uh, the session is over, you can share it with your friends because then we'll be dividing this uh, long session into chapters so that you can just go to the chapter that you want to revise. You don't have to revise all the, the, all the chapters that I have decide, discussed in this particular session. Now, new adjuvant chemotherapy is 3 to 4 cycles of chemotherapy followed by interval primary cytoreductive surgery. Good for patients who are medically unfit for surgery and where suboptimal debulking is likely. Okay, so good for patients who are medically unfit, you can do a new adjuvant chemotherapy before surgery and where suboptimal bulking is likely. Advantages of first giving chemotherapy followed by surgery is rapid clinical improvement, subsequent surgery easier and morbidity is reduced, optimum site reduction with minimal residual disease is possible. Answer this for me, which of the following chemotherapy drug regimen is, is recommended for germ cell and sex cord cell tumors. So, whether it is paclitexel, carboplatin, whether it is Zumab, uh, Bivazumab or uh, Pembrolizumab, definitely it is not this. We don't use these drugs in genital cancers. So, it's either this or this. So, the answer is definitely, you know the answer. It is bleomycin, etoposide and cisplatin. Cisplatin is P. Okay. So, this is the regimen for sex cord and uh, the germ cell tumors. Okay. Skipping this, uh, skipping this again. This is very important. I'm sure Dr. Ranjana must have covered this. These are the markers, the tumor markers. The yolk sac tumor will show what? AFP, alpha fetoprotein. This jovenuma will show, uh, yeah, sorry, I just skipped that, uh, Rahul. I just, I'm just going quickly now because I want to finish it. This germinoma will show what? Come on, tell me. 
कोरियो कार्सिनोमा डेफिनेटली एच सी जी एपिथील ये वन टू फाइव डिस जर्मन ओवर शो एल डी एच दीज आर दू मार्क विच आर वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर यू ओके सो आई एम नॉट वेटिंग फॉर यूर आंसर्स बिकॉज आई थिंक यू पीपल ऑल्सो नीड टू स्टडी मोर अदर सब्जेक्ट सो आई जस्ट वॉन्ट टू फिनिश दिस बिकॉज आई हैव सेलेक्टेड सर्टन टॉपिक्स एंड नीड टू फिनिश ऑब्सेट्रिक्स ऑल्सो नो नॉन म्यूसिनस एपिथीलियल ट्यूमर्स विल हैव सी ए वन टू फाइव म्यूसिनस वन विल हैव सी ए नाइनटीन नाइन एंड सी ई ए योग सैट ट्यूमर विल बी ए एफ पी एंड एंटीट्रिप्सिन ए एफ पी इज ऑल्सो सीन इन एम्ब्रियनल ट्यूमर्स अलॉन्ग विद एच सी जी एच सी जी स्पेसिफिक फॉर कोरियो कार्सिनोमा बट इट इज ऑल्सो सीन इन एम्ब्रियनल ट्यूमर्स सो एम्ब्रियनल ट्यूमर इज काइंड ऑफ मिक्सचर ऑफ कोरियो एंड योग सैट ओके डिस जर्मिनोमा विल बी एल डी एच एल डी एच एंड प्लासेंटल ए एल पी एंड ग्रेनुलोजा सेल ट्यूमर विल बी इनिमिन राइट Over in pathology and the characteristic pathologic features are very important. I am not going to read this slide because you must have done this with Dr. Ranjana. If you have not done this, it is very important. The typical pathologic features for all these uh, over in pathologies you need to know. Whether it's hob nail, Shiela Dua, ring case crystals, seminoma body is very very important. Now, which of the following suggests primary amenorrhea? Which of the following suggests primary amenorrhea? Eleven year old girl with Tanner stage one. 13 year old with tanner stage 5 14 year old with tanner stage 1 and 12 year old with tanner stage 4 can you answer this for me anybody what is primary amenorrhea patient is not having periods till what age what is the definition okay the definition is failure of onset of menarche beyond 15 years of age means she is having secondary sexual characteristics till 15 we can wait for Uh, she to have her menses beyond 13 if there is absence of secondary sexual characteristics answer is c k k it is c see 11 year old with tanner stage 1 she still developing she still doesn't have full secondary sexual characteristics 11 is too young okay if she doesn't have any secondary sexual characteristic till 14 this is the answer because beyond 13 if she is not developing any breast that means there is a problem 11 is too young 13 year old with tanner stage 5 you can wait up to 15 she is developing good amount of breast so give her at least 2 3 years till 15 she may have her menarche 12 year old with tanner stage 4 she is going in that right line it may she may develop till 15 you have to wait so with tanner stage 1 it is beyond 13 when we say that it is a primary amenorrhea so absence of menstruation till 13 or beyond 13 with no sexual secondary sexual characteristic good secondary sexual characteristic up to 15 we can wait absence of menstruation within 5 years of um, thalarke no menstruation till 14 years of age with signs of hirsutism excessive exercise or eating disorders this is primary amenorrhea now the most common cause is gonadal dysgenesis which is turner syndrome second most common cause is mullerian agenesis these are all the causes which i am not going to read out for you hypergonadotrophic hypogonadotrophic the third most common cause after mrkh first is turner's second is mrkh and the third most common cause is tfs androgen insensitivity where the genotype is xy it is androgen insensitivity genetically she is a male androgen insensitivity because androgens are high the patient is going to have very oily skin good looking females androgen is high so it gets converted into estrogen so the breast develops very well there is no hairy growth there is no pubic or axillary hair because the androgens do not act so that looks like a very good looking uh, female with good development of breast and these patients will need a vaginoplasty to resume their sexual activity and basically they will be reared up as a they will be brought up as a female cryptomenorrhea you know what it is imperforate hymen that is a congenital acquired is cervical stenosis i am not going through this these are all the slides that i wanted you to read you will get this pdf in the uh, manipal medes app if you click on the free trial you will get this pdf whatever i have made so you can just recap recapitulate as to what you have read so these are all the causes of primary amenorrhea depending upon the hyper hyper and eugonadotropic things now answer this for me 17 year old girl was brought by her mother to the outpatient department with complaints of primary amenorrhea with normal breast development and pubic hair so she has pubic hair she has breast development so she is definitely not a, uh, ais androgen insensitivity she definitely has good breast so it is not a turner syndrome but she is a primary amenorrhea because she is 17 so what uh, what diagnosis will you reach to no blind ending vagina and uterus was not palpable on examination definitely you will not do a pv examination in a 17 year old what they would want to say is that on examination the blind vagina was there because you can see the vagina uh, by local examination and then sonography did not show any so uterus so what is the answer come on quick one answer i need 
we get one answer and I, and I just tell you the, yeah, KK, it is right. It is Mullerian agenesis. It is not gonadal. It is not a dysgenesis because she has good breast development. Now, which of the following is not a cause of secondary amenorrhea? Not a cause of secondary amenorrhea. Very simple. Sheehan, Asherman, Turner's, PCOS, which will not cause secondary amenorrhea. There is a lag. I can see that on YouTube we are still having the previous question. Okay. Okay, now. Can you tell me the answer here? Is there a lot of lag here? Uh, okay, so I don't know whether it's a lag or you don't know the answer. The answer here is Turner's syndrome. Why Turner's? Because Turner's is going to cause primary amenorrhea. It is not going to cause secondary amenorrhea. Okay. I did not get an answer because I can see the lag. The question has just come up. Uh, okay, anyway, I will just uh, continue. So, it is definitely, she has his pituitary necrosis after PPH that can lead to secondary amenorrhea. Ashimans is most one of the most common causes of secondary amenorrhea. Turner's is a cause of primary amenorrhea. PCOS is again most common cause of secondary amenorrhea. Secondary amenorrhea, how do you define it? Either it is a patient who has had normal cycle so far and now suddenly for three months she has not had any periods. Or she is a patient of irregular cycles. She never had regular cycles but now for the last six months she is having no period. So, 3 months, 6 months, okay. Or less than 9 cycles in a year. Normally, it is 12 cycles in a year. But she is having less than 9 cycles in a year. She should be investigated as secondary amenorrhea. Now, Asherman syndrome will give you a normal LH, FSH and E2 because it is a problem in the uterus. Sheehan syndrome, there will be a pituitary necrosis. Everything will be low. PCOS, there will be high LH. High LH will lead to a normal E2 and a high E1 high E1, okay, and FSH will be low. This is a difference. In premature ovarian failure, everything will be, uh, sorry, not everything, low E2 will cause high LH and high FSH. So, these are the differences in the hormonal things. So, you need to know what are the differences in the secondary amenorrhea cases as regards to the hormones. Asherman, Sheehan, PCOS and primary ovarian failure. Then coming to delayed puberty, just one slide and we finish puberty. When secondary sexual characteristics do not develop till 13 years of age, similarly just like primary amenorrhea, yes KK, all hormones are normal here. When secondary sexual characteristics do not develop till 13 years of age, right? So that is why primary amenorrhea, we say that if there is no secondary sexual characteristic, beyond 13 it is abnormal. Minarche does not set until 13, 16 years, that is delayed puberty. Delayed puberty more common in males, precocious puberty more common in females. Normal upper limit of menarche is 15 years, just like we read in primary amenorrhea. Males, either there is no testicular growth till 14 years, then that is delayed puberty. Most common cause in male is, males is constitutional. In females, generally it is pathological. And the most common cause I told you is Turner's, followed by Mullerian, Rokitansky, MRKH, followed by the third one was um, yeah, AIS, androgen insensitivity syndrome. This slide, I think, is very important for you for people who do not understand what is Swyer's syndrome, what is pure gonadal dysgenesis, and what is Turner's syndrome. Turner's streak ovaries, in Swyer's, there will be streak testes. It's XY and XX and X0 here. Okay, these are the differences. Short stature, web neck, CVS problems are seen only in Turner's, nothing else. Nobody else will have these problems. In Swyer's syndrome, because it's a testes, it's a testis, so hypoplastic uterus will be there because it's a dysgenetic testis. So, MIS will be absent. Mullerian inhibiting hormone will be absent. Testosterone will not be uh, proper enough for the Wolfian duct to develop. So, hypoplastic uterus because, because there is a very low amount of estrogen. Externally, they may look like an under-virilized male. Under-virilized male. So, they will have probably a very ambiguous genitalia. They are technically males, but they don't look like a proper virilized male. Okay. Here, it will be an infantile female. Here, it will be a normal female. <clears throat> now, match the following. I will do this for you because it's very simple. MRKH will have 46XX. Swyers is 46XY. Androgen insensitivity is again 46XY. Turner's is 46X0. Because the time is short, so I'm just not letting you answer this question. IQ, yes, Turner's IQ is good. 
I have seen Turner's patient. The IQ is actually good. It is just the looks, the web uh, space, the, uh, the, uh, the cubitus valgus they have, the hands are like this and then the, the shoulders are like this. So they look abnormal, but the IQ is good. It is not like mental retardation of Down syndrome. Now, Swyer syndrome, just quickly telling you, pure gonadal degenesis, the testes are not working. Testosterone is not enough for the wolf and duck to develop. It degenerates. There is no AMH because AMH comes from the Sertoli cells. So, that is why Mullerian duct will develop, but it will be infantile because estrogen is not enough. 85% are unknown. Gonads are testes and dysgenetic and the external genitalia may look like a female. So, they are a male hermaphrodites. Male pseudo hermaphrodites. Right? <coughs> Sorry. Male because it is XY and because they look, they may look like female, they may look like a male. It's an ambiguous genitalia. Undescended testes, increased chances of malignancy of testes. Now, there is no ambiguous genitalia. Okay. No ambiguous genitalia at birth. I've written here, but I told you it may be ambiguous. So, it can, you can say it is an under virilized, under virilized male. The Genitalia of exclusion, the genitalia of exclusion is female. If the testosterone is not enough, the patient will develop into female organs. So, it may look like a female. Generally, ambiguity is not there. So, but there is a confusion. There is an under-virilization of the male. Adrenarche does not happen. Breasts do not develop as E2 is not there. Delayed puberty, normal height, primary amenorrhea, high FSH and high LH because testosterone is not there to give the negative inhibition. Complete androgen insensitivity here, the 46XY is there, testes is acting, but enough androgen is there, but it is not acting on the receptor. So, high androgen getting converted into estrogen, as I told you, good breast, they have a lot of acne or you can say oily skin and the pubic hair and axillary hair is absent. And the internal genitalia will be absent because neither wolfin duct nor mullerian duct will develop. But externally, they look like females because they have breast and they have a very small short vagina with no uterus at all. So, the vaginoplasty can be done for them to con uh, continue with their married and sexual life. Precocious puberty, appearance of any secondary sexual characteristic before 8 years, that is breast before 8 years and menarche before 10 years is basically precocious puberty. It may be isosexual when entirely the entire, uh, you can say the sequence of puberty is followed. Means thalarche, then adrenarche, puberche is happening but and later menarche. But it can be heterogeneous when there is excessive androgen coming from ovary or adrenal. Then she may develop axillary hair, pubic hair before, menarche come late. So that is not isosexual, that is heterosexual. 90% are idiopathic because they are constitutional, precocious puberty, very common in females and 90% will have no organic cause. Now, coming to obstetrics, okay, almost done with gynecology, most important topics I have done. Primary gravida is in labor, station minus 1, cervix posterior, 30% effaced, 1 cm dilatation, consistency soft. Calculate the Bishop score. Shall I do it for you? Because it is a very simple, simple you need to know this chart. You need to know this chart. You need to know that bishop and modified bishop, how they are different. Effacement is subjective because if I do a PV, I may say it is a 50% effacement. If you do a PV, you may say it's 20% effaced. So that is why now they have included length of the cervix. Rest all is same. The only thing is here they are starting with station minus 3. Here they are starting with station minus 2. In this, in bishop, it is 0, 1, 2, 3. Here it is only 0, 1 and 2. It's simplified. Modified bishop is simplified. So, depending whether they are asking modified bishop score or a proper bishop score, you need to know this chart. Okay? Now, again, very important question. Do you know this? How you actually identify the fetal position? First of all, students, you have to see the syncyput and the occiput. Occiput is triangular. Syncyput is diamond shaped. Denominator in the vertex position is always occiput. You know that. So, if the occiput is... Uh, Pointing anteriorly, it will be an anterior position. It will be posterior if it is pointing posteriorly. So, in this pelvis, where is the pubic symphysis? This is the pubic symphysis and this is the sacral promontory. So, the occiput is pointing posteriorly. So, it is definitely OP position. Now, right or left? For me, it is my right. So, for the patient, it will be left. Her anatomical left. So, it will be left occipital posterior. Because the patient is lying in front of me. So, she is kind of like a mirror image of me. So, my right means her left. So, it is LOP. Okay. Then coming to modified Robson's classification. Now, modified Robson's class 1 will include what? It will include nullipara, singleton, cephalic and spontaneous labor. So, why I want you to basically remember this. First of all, you need to know that there are 10 group classification systems where the cesarean sections have been grouped into 10 groups according to different categories of the pregnancy. So, category of pregnancy means what? 
category means it is either uh, 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 multiple pregnancy, it's a multiple pregnancy or it's a malpresentation because they have included cephalic uh, they have included cephalic breach uh, in malpresentation breach breach is included transverse lie and oblique lie have been included okay past obstetrical record will tell whether it's a previous lscs or it's a multi or it's a primary course of labor and delivery it will tell whether it's a spontaneous labor or it's an induced labor or it's a pre labor she's not in labor at all and the gestational age whether it's a preterm or a full term this is how the Robson's classification goes. So these four criteria, they may make an MCQ for you and you have to decide what are the categories divided into. So different categories of pregnancy, past obstetrical record, course of labor and delivery and gestational age of the pregnancy. Okay. So the first thing was that, that they asked you was nullipara, singleton, cephalic, full term, spontaneous labor. In the second, instead of spontaneous, they are putting pre-labor or not in, not in labor or induced labor. Again, nullipara. Third and fourth are same, but only thing is they instead of nulli, they have changed it into multi. So it's a multi now. It's a multi with spontaneous labor. It's a multi with either no labor or induced labor. Coming to five, it is simply a multi para with singleton cephalic full term with previous cesarean section. So five is a multi with a previous cesarean section. Till here, it is absolutely fine. Six is singleton breach. Seven is multi para breach. 8, 9, 10. 8 is a different category. There's a multiple pregnancy. 9 and 10, why I found it a bit absurd is 9 and 10, they have just included nulli para with transverse oblique and then preterm. They have not included multi para with transverse or oblique and they have not included multi para with preterm. So these two are missing, but they are happy with just 10 classifications. So it's very simple. So first one is spontaneous, then comes induced. First two are nulli para, and then next two are multi. This is how it goes. And it's very simple to remember. And they may ask you this question. It is important. Okay. Then which of the following is false regarding management of diabetes in pregnancy? Tell me somebody. Okay. I'll wait for this answer. Elective cesarean has no role in reducing incidence of brachial plexus injury. In a patient being planned for induction of labor, night dose of intermediate insulin is given as planned and the morning dose is withheld. In active labor, if the RBS, the random blood sugar, is less than 70, dextrose 5 is started at 100 to 150 ml per hour till the RBS becomes more than 100 mg percent. Capillary blood glucose monitoring is kept at fasting around 95, postprandial 1 hour 140 and 2 hours 120. Tell me what is wrong. What is not right? As I told you, GDM is very, very important. Anyone? Okay. Why is it taking so long? It's a very simple question. If you have read diabetes, gestational diabetes in pregnancy, it's a very simple question. Okay. So, the answer is elective cesarean section. Yes. Right, KK. Good. I was waiting for your answer. Elective cesarean has no role in reducing incidence of brachial plexus injury because it has a role. That is why macrosomic babies, it is better to deliver by elective cesarean, especially the babies who are above 4.5 kgs. Okay. So, now we're coming to... Uh, quick recapitulation of the diabetes pregnancy in pregnancy monitoring and management. Glucose monitoring diet and exercise that is MNT, medical nutrition therapy is given. Should be continued for at least two weeks to achieve the following. Metabolic goal is fasting less than 95, post meal 1 hour 140, 2 hours to 120, HbA1c preferably 6 or less than 6.5, average glucose less than 100. Now, if the patient is induced, being induced, First of all, induction is not a contraindication. You can induce. Insulin requirement during labor because she is not eating will decrease. So, you have to be careful. Okay. It is better for the glucose to go high slightly rather than hypoglycemia. Hyperglycemia is better and less dangerous as compared to hypoglycemia. Early hospitalization may be required to stabilize the diabetes, to minimize PET, polyhydramnios, preterm labor and to select the appropriate time for delivery. Induction is safe. Preferred mode of delivery is vaginal in generally all the cases. After admission, you start with normal saline. 
you start with normal saline. If she goes into labor, then you add neutralizing dose of insulin to 5% dextrose. Routine insulin dose night can be given. Morning has to be uh, omitted because now she will not be eating much. She's going under induction. She's going to labor. Start a two-hourly monitoring first once she is in the intrapartum period. So initially, you start with two-hourly monitoring. Once she is in labor, intrapartum, then you do one-hourly monitoring. Add insulin to normal saline if it is required according to the sliding scale. I'll tell you the sliding scale. If the patient goes into labor, now she will need glucose, okay, because now she's not eating. So, you have to start 5% dextrose. From NS, you start to that and her glucose is falling less than 70. You have to bring it to around 100. That was the question here. And the second uh, option was right. So, if it is less than 70, you give her 5% uh, dextrose with neutralizing dose of insulin and the dextrose has to be 100 to 150 ml per hour. IV drip of 1 liter, 5% dextrose with 10 units insulin is the neutralizing dose. But if the sugar is less than 70, then you have to GDM in ANC, ASAP or first visit. What? Uh, I don't understand your question. Recommended GDM in ANC. ASAP or first visit. Oh, you mean uh, when you do a dipsy? The dipsy test is done at 28 weeks. That is the time when the patient is highly uh, susceptible to the diabetogenic, diabetogenic conditions of the pregnancy. Initially, first she comes, you do it. And if she has a history, if she's high risk, then you do a GTT. Otherwise, you can do a screening at 28 weeks. Okay. Now, ASAP, we don't need to do unless the GDM is actually the blood sugar, random blood sugar is coming back more than 200 or more than uh, after two hours glucose, it is coming to more than 140. Then you go for a subject, a proper screening. Okay. So, random blood glucose should be normal. Now, fetal monitoring, you have to do with Doppler, CTG, FBS and early cord clamping to avoid hypervolemia. Early cord clamping within a minute has to be done to avoid hypervolemia. Epidural is good for pain relief. If planned cesarean, again, you have to omit the evening dose of, sorry, omit the morning dose, but give her the night dose of insulin. Now, cesarean is indicated if more than 4.5 kg macrosomic or any other obstetric indication. Sliding scale, you need to know. If it is 90 to 120, that is fine. You don't need to add any insulin. Just give her NS. If it is 120 to 140, add 4 units. If it is 140 to 180, is 6 units. More than 180, you add 8 units of insulin to the normal saline. That is a sliding scale. Now, coming to cardiac malformations in a fetus, during a routine ultrasound scan at 16 weeks. So, you saw a cardiac malformation. Now, you know cardiac malformations will happen not in GDM. They will happen in overt diabetes when the HbA1c is above 6, above 6.5. So, what is the minimum amount of fasting blood glucose recommended by ECOG which can lead to cardiac malformations? Tell me. This question is important. Tell me the answer. KK is saying C. Mm, that's not correct. Okay. ACOG recommends that the fasting minimum uh, blood sugar which, which can cause fetal malformations is 126 milligram per deciliter. So, the answer is B. Now, according to American Diabetic Association, yes, you're right, uh, Sparsh, Sparsh Shivasta. Yeah. According to ADA, the criteria for diagnosis of over diabetes is random sugar more than 200. So, you did a random sugar, it came more than 200 and there were classic symptoms of diabetes. So, that is over diabetes. Fasting sugar more than 126, HbA1c more than 6.5 and two or more abnormal values after doing a dipsy, 100 gram of oral glucose tolerance test during pregnancy. So, coming to dipsy, which is the nationally recognized screening test for diabetes in, in India. So, we do a dipsy, we do not call the patient empty stomach. I hope it is visible. Let me just zoom it. Yeah. So, whether a, whenever a pregnant woman comes for antenatal uh, visit, irrespective of her means, you do not ask her to come for uh, like empty stomach. So, you do a 75 grams glucose test, check her blood sugar after 2 hours, 110, less than 120 is normal, 120 to 140 is glucose intolerance, 140 to 200 is gestation diabetes, more than 200 is overt diabetes. This is how you basically diagnose GDM and overt diabetes. Now coming to, let me skip this question because there was a question in last year's I set on lithium. Now lithium because it is coming uh, basically in the, uh, in the criteria of psychiatry. So I just wanted to include this because I, even I had to consult the psychiatrist to ask, answer this question for you. So you people asked why we are decreasing the dose, why we are not increasing the dose. So the answer here is because the patient is on lithium and she is in the third trimester. In the third trimester, there is a lot of fluctuation in the doses of lithium because the initially because of GFR increase is there in the second trimester. So a lot of lithium goes out. 
of the body so in that case the clinicians are inclined to increase the dose of lithium if at all she is already maintained on lithium then you may increase slightly in the second trimester third trimester and after delivery the dose might go down so in that case you are saying b increasing the dose the answer is actually decreasing the dose it's actually decreasing the dose okay why because she is taking 750 mg and she is well maintained she has had no seizures so you can decrease the dose in third trimester in this question the next question you may increase the dose because she had a history of 3 to 4 excarbage exacerbation episodes i'm not reading the entire question because it's just the same she is on lithium she is in third trimester the first one was well maintained did not have any seizure in last one year this one has had 3 to 4 exacerbations in that case you may increase the dose and the answer is because lithium fluctuations are too much too much especially in the second trimester with increased gfr in third it may lead to uh, toxicity so in that case you may decrease the dose if it, she is well maintained okay you don't have to change to sodium valproate if she is well maintained so this is what the answer is that is why i included this question because it is a uh, probably a high yield question because it has come twice then coming to uh, this question okay shall i do this question for you because this was just last year's question and this was nothing you cannot actually pinpoint as to which chapter they are asking it is just a very very ins at level of question you have to use your brains and think what uh, what is the answer and can you answer this for me if you know the answer then i'll tell you how this answer is this question has to be approached 25 year old lady had an uneventful vaginal delivery on postpartum day one, she presented with PPH, complaints of visual change and severe headaches. So, it is definitely what? It is PIH. A few hours after the complaint, she is found to be unresponsive state. She is intubated and put on ventilation. So, suddenly she had PIH symptoms, PPH also. So, she had hemorrhagic shock also and her blood pressure has gone down to 60 by 40, very, very low. So, that is hemorrhagic shock plus she is unresponsive. She is on ventilation now and she has tachycardia hypertensive uh, shock it is hemorrhagic shock tachycardia will be there blood sugar is very low this is something very very unusual we don't generally deal with such cases in gynae blood pressure can go low because hemorrhage pih can happen blood pressure can go up and down whatever but why sugar is so low hematocrit wbc count for normal okay so there was no infection hematocrit is normal so there is no uh, hemorrhagic shock as such hematocrit is normal which of the following drugs would reverse help reverse this state tell me First answer the question, then I'll tell you as to how to approach it. This is definitely a multidisciplinary approach question. It cannot be simply solved by a gynecologist. It has to involve a physician and anesthetist. So, postpartum pituitary necrosis, okay? That is what you think, okay? That's probably uh, what is causing blood sugar low, sh low blood sugar. So, what will you give? What is the answer? It can be pituitary necrosis. Everything is going low. But why blood sugar is low? I am just thinking. Hmm. What is the answer? Tell me. Okay. The answer is steroid. In emergency, whenever you have to do something, you have to basically save the patient. The life-saving drug is steroid. It has to be steroid. Injection, dobutamine, thyroxine, activated protein C, they have no role here. They all will fluctuate the blood pressure, I'll tell you. This is a case of postpartum shock, probably due to hypoglycemia and blood loss. We don't know why hypoglycemia happened. There may be an element of preeclampsia as well. The motive is to bring the blood pressure and blood sugar up, otherwise the patient will die. Dobutamine should not be used in this condition because it causes peripheral vasodilatation resulting in decrease in diastolic blood pressure. So, dobutamine, it will cause dilatation and decrease even further decrease the blood pressure. Things which are in favor of steroids are fluid retention, transfuse fluid will be retained leading to rapid increase in blood pressure. That is what steroids do. The adrenal steroids, what do they do? They increase the blood pressure. Adrenaline, they all do that. Gluconeogenesis, yes, it will form, uh, it will increase the blood sugar. Although additional vasopressor in the form of noradrenaline will also be required. Not just steroids, you may need noradrenaline also. Dobutamine will increase the systolic blood pressure, but it will decrease the diastolic. So, it is not given. Steroid will increase the sugar also as well as the BP. So, steroid is a better answer. Last slide for today or probably the second slide. Now, second last. Partogram. This was requested by you all. We do not know, ma'am, how to uh, basically assess a question of partogram. Now, this is part 1 ok can you see this is part 1 of the graph part 1 is including fetal heart rate it is including amniotic fluid part 2 is showing us the cervical dilatation and descent 
and it is also showing us the hours okay and part 3 is showing us the contractions per minute oxytocin is not mentioned here it is blank and it is also showing the pulse and the blood pressure and the drugs given drugs is blank here you can see the pulse and bp is kind of static it is the pulse is between 80 it is between 80 to 100 maximum the blood pressure is 110 70 110 70 so that is normal coming to the third part you can see the contractions these are moderate contractions mild to moderate contractions still about you can say four hours after that they became very very strong so what can you see here what can you see here the main thing that we see remember the main thing that we see in a partogram is the cervical dilatation and that is being plotted with the help of a cross the descent of the head is zero and it is not shown here zero means o that is a mark that they have to give so they have not shown that cervical dilatation they started plotting at four centimeter because the the new modified partogram who partogram says that the active phase starts at four centimeter so the plotting has to start at four centimeter so four centimeter they started plotting and after around four hours so this was zero hour after around four hours it was done again and it was around four six centimeter so there was a slight increase so this patient is lying not on the left of the alert line but it is lying in between the alert and the action this is actually action this is action line and we know the difference between action and alert line is four hours okay so the second pv examination showed a two centimeter increase so they may have started oxytocin although they have not mentioned but the oxytocin was not required because she actually had a very very strong contraction building up so now what does that mean she's not dilating it's a flat graph for the next four hours it is flat strong contractions meconium is happening you can see the amniotic fluid was clear till here and now it is becoming blood stained and the last two readings are meconium stain and can you see the molding it was plus one here now it is going to plus two and plus three typical question of what typical question of you tell me the answer i will not show you the options you tell me what it is it's a straight line plateauing after six centimeter dilatation typical definition after six centimeter dilation with ruptured membranes with molding growing up to grade plus two plus three with very good contractions not dilating what is the diagnosis she delivered with a cesarean section what is the diagnosis tell me kk who else is there sparsh abdul abdul has gone probably who else was answering initially tell me the answer of this question i am though i am not giving you the the hints or the options and this is the second last question then one more question and we are done come on kk waiting Rahul Soni, you were also answering very well. I have given you all the hints. You have seen the partogram. Now you know what is happening. Okay. Okay, I am not getting any answer guys. Is it a lag of YouTube or you are not able to understand? A straight line in between the alert and the action with grade 2, grade 3 molding, strong contractions, meconium staining, not dilating. What do you expect? And the fetal heart rate going down. It was 140 and then it came down to 130 and now it is up to 90, 100. Come on. Okay, let me show you the options. Now, can you tell me? Now, can you tell me the answer? Is it CPD? Is it inadequate uterine contraction? Is it prolonged latent phase or is it none? I am not give you, going to give you this answer. It is very simple because I have explained the entire graph to you. This is how you have to see the graph. Come on guys, is it CPD, is it inadequate uterine contraction? Was it inadequate uterine contraction? You saw such solid squares here. See it's solid squares. Solid squares means very, very strong uterine contractions. So it is definitely not inadequate uterine contraction. Very good starters. Thank you. I was amazed nobody is answering. It is CPD. 
it is cephalopelvic disproportion molding grade 2 grade 3 meconium happening so much contraction is there that the doctor doesn't need to give oxytocin there is no dilatation for four hours i'm wondering why they waited for so long from here till here they should have just seen that it is a plateau and they should have just gone for a cesarean section but because it's a question being put up for you so they have done a proper four hourly monitoring so at four hourly and then eight hours it's around four hourly or three hours later it was kind of after six centimeter dilatation that is a definition of active phase arrest so yes it is cpd okay now how do we actually assess the partogram first part is fetal heart rate amniotic fluid and molding everything was shown here second part shows cervical dilatation and fetal head descent this was not shown here okay but cervical dilatation after four centimeter alert line action line there's a difference of four centimeter in between four hours sorry in between Latent phase, now that's the definition you need to know. ACOG and Williams, they say that latent phase will end at 6 cm. Active phase has to be plotted after 6 cm. WHO graph, which we just saw, the modified partogram, it is still showing the older WHO guidelines that the active phase starts after 4 cm. So, you start plotting after 4 cm. But Williams has come up, sorry, WHO has come up with recent guidelines which have not been updated in partogram. They say now it is 5 cm. So, 4, 5, 6, 4 is what we are following. 5 is the new guideline which will come very soon. Williams and American guidelines, ACOJ, Williams is American book. So they are following 6 cm. Now, third part will show you the number and the duration of contractions which was, which was seen there, right? Oxytocin, dose, drugs, IV fluids, pulse rate, blood pressure, temperature, urine output. These are all the third uh, part of the partogram. Most important is the number and the duration of contractions and whether oxytocin given or not. Okay? Yes, Pranjwal, it is A. Right, so the answer is A, that is CPD. Then active phase arrest is only diagnosed if the membranes have ruptured and the cervix is more than 6 cm dilated. So in this partogram, they have shown everything. Cervix is dilated more than 6 cm, meconium was coming means it was membranes had ruptured. So that was active phase arrest for 4 hours. So either there is no dilatation for 4 hours, that was the typical case here where there were good contractions or if the contractions were not good, they were just kind of colored like this only. But here, actually, there were solid contractions. But if it had been like this, then they will mention that oxytocin was also given. So, after oxytocin also, if there is no dilatation with inadequate contractions with oxytocin augmentation, that is active phase arrest. Somebody asked me, do we get active phase arrest? What is active phase arrest? This is the definition. Okay. Now, management has to be as per condition. Partogram of arrest is a straight horizontal line. What happened here? So, if it is meconium, what happened here? Molding, then you don't have to wait for 4 to 6 hours. You simply go into cesarean. Okay? If there is no molding and there is no meconium, we can still wait. You may give oxytocin. Okay? Now, the, uh, yeah, KK is saying WHO labor care guide 5 cm modified WHO 4 cm. Very good. Last question for today. Very, very simple. Nursing assistant posted in the obstetric care unit was asked to plot a part to graph to monitor the progress of labor after how much dilatation should she start plotting the graph simple let me check if yeah this is the last slide thank you pranav that is it we are done with the live session today i hope you enjoyed in the next session whenever we do it we may do it just before the neat pg exam all the best for your ins set i tried to cover most of the high yield topics most of the questions that you had asked me to um, discuss and this chapter this entire video will be divided into chapters so that you can just click on that chapter and go through that staging you don't have to go through the entire two and a half hours video okay thank you so much all the best children make your schedule next 15 days you have to study all the subjects last 10 then 10 days left you have to do only the uh, second revision and the last five days only the topics which you don't remember so this is how i will divide my month into 15 10 and 5 okay all the best and see you all very soon thank you very much bye bye